Good evening, friends. Good evening, senior faculty, practicing surgeons, and young residents. I'm sure today you are going to have a feast of uh, galaxy of national faculty of national eminence going to share their experience in handling the difficult part of the bariatric operations. Friends, IGS Prime Time is a fortnightly which has been curated by the senior leaders of IGS. to bring the special talents of lifelong wisdom which has been acquired by eminent experts in and out of country to give you the best of the knowledge and best of the wisdom for the benefit of the practicing surgeons and the youngsters may I now have the honor of inviting our president professor sunil dipapad professor sunil is known to all the surgical fraternity of uh, internal invasive surgery this part of the country and i am sure we have participants from more than six countries the associated institutions of friendly institutions of iags as a customary word it is my responsibility to introduce our president professor sunil papad is the chairman and head of the surgical gastroenterology at the didi hospital samdabad he has been very much active academics since the last 20 years into iags at various levels of iags from the member to the president he has held up all the important positions for year over year and he has ascended carefully ladder of the iags friends it has been a pleasure to have the leadership qualities of dr sunil papad guiding us to do program after program and he has special interest in forehead surgery and endotherapy and he has been an eminent surgeon doing advanced endoscopy and advanced laparoscopic procedures also so ladies and gentlemen may i have the honor of inviting our president professor sunil papad to welcome the faculty and welcome the program over to you sir thank you dr kanakwell good evening friends respected faculties i am very pleased and honored to welcome you all to this yet again exciting episode of uh, IGS prime time this prime time has made its space on digital platform over last one year and now we are clocking more than 2500 of audience every time we are having a prime time program IGS is a 28 year old organization which is the largest of laparoscopic surgeons in india the most vibrant organization and because of the wisdom of is four fathers and founding members we are seeing the fruits today of excellent scientific and fellowship activities we lost 6 months because of the covid pandemic second wave this year however in spite of that we have been successful in doing more than 10 online programs and now one by one we have started fgs and scope fgs we already completed fall supper gi in delhi very well organized by our dear friend dr randi padavan and we have upcoming programs like uh, lab college skill course in jaipur fiages in goa then we have falls bariatric in kolkata falls arnia falls arnia in kanyakumari then we have falls robotics in delhi and fagi that is advanced endoscopy course in guwahati just last week our dear friend dr kanakwell organized a combo event in chennai fiages and efiages which was very successful with more than 200 delegates and it added more than 100 new members to iages we are going back again to chennai next month this month only to all colorectal organized by dr pravin raj friends obesity all of us are into the treatment of obesity in one or the other way but obesity surgery has made great inroads over last two decades in india today we are blessed to have the most exciting bariatric surgeons of india giving their presentations there are plenty of bariatric surgeries procedures and endoscope is happening and it is of utmost importance for all of us to know and be aware of 
various complications which can happen of variety of features. I welcome all the faculties, the uh, all the leading bariatric surgeons, and we have the pleasure of having a president of Obesity Society of India, Dr. Manish Khaitan, among us as a moderator. I'm sure this program will break all the previous records, and this will be a once-in-a-lifetime program for all of us. Friends, all these programs are telecast live on DocPlexus, on Facebook Live, on YouTube channel, and they will be available later on on IAGS YouTube channel for further viewing. Thank you very much for being here, all for my dear here, faculties. All my dear faculties. I once again welcome you once all. Again welcome you all to this platform. This platform. Over to Dr. Kanakar. Over to Dr. Kanakar. Thank you, President. I am sure we will update to all the standards which are setting at I bar for the academics for the IAGS. I am sure back to back academics is waiting. Uh, academic feast is awaited by all the students and the younger colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen, now we move to the business of uh, this evening. We have the talks from eminent faculty who have been having their lifetime dedicated for this specialization of uh, their professions. For which we have the honor of having the first moderator being none other than uh, Dr. Praveen Raj who himself has been a very eminent uh, bariatric surgeon who has had original textbooks being published. People start publishing the articles. He has moved to have his own monogram of various areas of bariatric surgery compiled and it is now revered as a very important textbook across the globe. To his feather and feather of the cap, he has had his MBBS, MS, and later he did his DMB in surgical gastroenterology and he has obtained PhD in bariatric surgery. To add more further, he has got trained at multiple centers in Australia, Neil Cornell, New York, and his annual program on laprofit has been a very astounding success. The mere fact he has been present in OSSI, Amasi, and IAGS shows the dedication and the commitment to the profession of bariatric surgery. May I have the honor of inviting Dr. Praveen Raj to moderate the first session. Over to Dr. Praveen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanagavel, uh, for the wonderful introduction. And I think I would like to thank IAGS uh, for this wonderful uh, prime time and the different academic initiatives done on a regular basis. And I think, I think Dr. Kanagavel, yourself have been doing a great job with, with this regard. And at the leadership of IAGS with the President, Dr. Sunil Poppet, doing a great job. And I think it's, it's it's a pleasure and privilege to be part of this uh, wonderful session on bariatric surgery focused on the complications as such. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you Professor Sandeep Agarwal, I think who's the uh, I think well-known bariatric surgeon in the country from the prestigious Institute of Ames and uh, who also is a surgeon, who's also the surgeon who did the first robotic gastric bypass in the country and who has some of the largest number of publications in the country in different aspects, not just from the surgical aspect, but, but from the science behind bariatric surgery. And with this regard, I think we have worked together so well for, for, the, for, for a long, long period of time. And uh, I think none other than Sandeep Agarwal would be the uh, right, uh, right surgeon to talk to you on uh, general bariatric surgery. However, for the topic for today, which is the complications of sleeve gastrectomy. And I think it's wonderful to see Dr. Sandeep after a long, long time. I think COVID has kept us away for long. And I think good to see you. And I'm sure you'll do great just for your talk. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sandeep. Over to you. And looking forward for your lecture. <clears throat> yeah, good evening, everyone, dear friends and uh, colleagues. And thanks, uh, Praveen, for the introduction. And uh, also, like to thank Dr. Sunil Popat and Dr. Kanak well for this opportunity to be talking on a very important topic, uh, which is really important in bariatric surgery because we are the communist so I'll just be sharing my screen and uh, so can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. We are able to see your screen, sir. Okay. Uh, so I bring greeting from names and uh, 
So again, as I said, the topic is an important one. Leave gastrectomy being one of the most common procedures. Sixty percent of the all the bariatric procedures across the globe are sleep gastrectomy. And despite a lot of initial issues and myths about sleep, it has come of age and has become a very standard procedure and evolved in technique over the last ten years to be a fairly you know safe procedure. I must say that. There's no conflict of interest as far as this uh, talk is concerned. If you look at the complications of sleep uh, or any other bariatric procedure, uh, you know, as such, the leak is probably the most dangerous complications, may not be the most common. Bleeding, uh, stricture and other issues leading to food intolerance. And in the long term, uh, gastroesophageal uh, reflux and barriers. And there are other complications, but I'll focus on these four because the time is short, limited. So we talk about sleep falling gastrectomy, uh, sleep gastrectomy. As I said, it's the most feared complication. Uh, the overall reported leak rate globally is varies from 0.7 and average being 2.5%, but over the years it is reduced to roughly between 1 to 2%, less over the last decade. And in a you know, paper by Dr. Michel Gainer. Uh, he showed that leak rate is decreasing, you know, roughly in, in 46,000 cases, showed roughly about 1.1%. Why is it important? Because leak leads to abdominal sepsis, multi organ failure, prolonged admission, chronic gastric fistula, a lot of morbidity and, and some mortality. And this requires multiple interventions, whether endoscopic or operative or radiologic. And it's, it's a real trauma, both to the patient as well as surgeon. And mortality has been reported up to 3.3%. If you look at the diagnosis of sleep, uh, it's basically clinical as in all other you know, areas of surgery, but there are laboratory parameters which can help, like brain photomyelase or Syriac protein. Imaging is required in most cases, and sometimes we may have to resort to pre laparoscopy. We are all aware of the clinical features, fever, more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, tachycardia, more than 100 per minute, abdominal pain, left shoulder pain, Tachypnea, patient not looking well, I think it's probably one of the most, you know, important thing. If you go on a round, every day one should exclude a leak, you know, looking at the patient and other parameters. And obviously symptoms have been reported at the time of leak. In an early leak, tachycardia is probably the most important symptom. And for the late leak, fever is the most important symptom. In this series, uh, by, you know, uh, 16 leaks, fever was found to be the most important symptom as most of the leaks present late. So the diagnosis is, you know, uh, you, have, you have to have a low threshold, the sensation symptom may be delayed, and hence high index of suspicion is absolutely mandatory. Don't rely on the drains. You know, drains are usually used, including us, you know, we still use it, but they are, have a low sensitivity to identify the leak. And a drain to the mile is may have a high predictive value. But the most important probably uh, laboratory parameter used nowadays is C-reactive protein more than 150 milligram is an indicator of a complication. Imaging, as I said, is frequently used. Uh, however, upper GI series, you know, has a poor predictive value and in a negative study it does not rule out a leak. Uh, a first investigation choice is CCT, oral and IV, and one can even an additional on-table gulp of oral contrast and has been reported to have a detection rate of leak of 75%. Sometimes fluoroscopy may be used, a gastrointestinal fluoroscopy may be used in combination, and patient may be asked to lie down the left, uh, right lateral, that means the left side down, and, and it can increase your detection rate of leaks. In our own experience, CT scan and upper GI study are complementary, if other may help, and vice versa. So, as I said, repeat the study in the right lateral position, in the supine position. These are some of the images showing, you know, leak, uh, a controlled leak coming from the Drain again, a small contained leak in the upper part of the sleeve. So, you know, these things can help again. The hair again, a collection in the perigastric and the perisplenic region. So, how do you manage leak once you diagnose it? it depends on first factor is the severity of the hemodynamic stability, then is the time of appearance and then the location. So, if you look at if the patient has frank peritonitis or hemodynamic instability, which is uncommon because most of the leaks are small in our own experience. That, I mean, we hardly have a patient who will present with frank peritonitis. Obviously, once it's there, you have to resort to a prompt, a laparoscopy, or a laparotomy. And 
the prime uh, you know intervention is the drainage with generous lavage a feeding jejunostomy and some sort of or you know depending on the time of surgery now the time becomes crucial so if you are within 72 hours of surgery then a primary closure may be attempted along with a mental you know reinforcement or a serosal patch or a t tube or foley's gastrostomy however if you have more than 72 to 96 hours and no attempt should be made to repair the uh, defect because it increases in size it makes the things worse so drainage and lavage alone will help here if the patient is hematologically stable uh, again within 72 hours you know uh, one can resort to laparoscopic drainage and feeding the nostril because that's the time you can close the defect but if it is more than 72 hours which is usually the case in most of our case should resort to one can easily you know manage the patient with conservative approach and what is a conservative approach in includes iv antibiotics which is broad spectrum image guided catheter drainage which is you know if you have a skilled radiologist is probably one of the best ways to drain a localized collection the nasogenal feeding which can be done in next few days they may not be done immediately on the diagnosis only and proton pump inhibitors again iv antibiotics may be required for prolonged periods so this is the our standard approach for a management of a you know leak Uh, which presents after 72 hours if you look at these images this is a patient with a small leak with a perisplenic collection uh, managed with nasogenal feeding didn't require a drainage but it was a controlled leak and after 3 to 4 weeks the contrast was going down the you know lesion uh, without any leak so uh, again we have a, you know about roughly about manage, uh, manage about 6 to 7 cases like that with successful outcome Uh, what are the intervention persistent leaks and i will talk about endoscopic options in brief because they become popular and then there are the surgical options so uh what are the endoscopic options you know uh one of the commonest uh, you know intervention used nowadays is the self expanding metallic stents in the plastic stents and some people if the defect is small one can use clips as in this uh, you know uh, clip we have tried using clip uh, in this patient with our defect was small but did not succeed and so the success of clips depends on the size of the defect then you have tissue sealants suturing systems and the internal drainage techniques uh the basic principles are you drain the collection either radiologically surgically or endoscopically then considering the various aspects of the leak the defect size the margins the viability one can determine the appropriate endoscopic approach so what are the principles of endoscopic management treat the distal obstruction with balloon dilated or luminous stents because obstruction is a common you know cause of leak a distal obstruction remove foreign bodies from the leak site and uh, intervene early that's what the endoscopists say also uh, from our own experience we have not required endoscopic interventions and whenever we have tried we failed actually so maybe you need a really expert bariatric endoscopist to do these things and what are the endoscopic techniques the closure techniques the covering techniques and the drainage techniques the closure techniques include clips as i showed uh, you know endoscopic sutures and the uh, endoscopic you know uh, sutures the covering techniques include stents the tissue sealants and the drainage techniques which are used, which are used you know in uh, chronic fistula the endoscopic vacuum therapy pigtail septotomy and balloon dilatation i won't go into the details of these approaches uh, we don't have any practical experience but nowadays uh, you know stents are basically used early if you are planning to use a stent uh, use it early in an early clinic less than 45 days because more than you know after 4 to 6 weeks the tract is epithelialized and stents may not work and use a stent which is designed for sleep like a mega stent you know which has a decreased chance of slippage So this is an interesting review of endoscopic management leaks and fistula with bariatric surgery published in Surgical Endoscopy about a couple of years back, which said, which showed, which said about 37 studies uh, with about three patients of sleep, you know, large, you know, uh, sort of a data. We said self-expanding stents are useful for large leaks in fistulas. Usual duration is six to eight weeks, uh, and uh, the healing rate is roughly about 92 percent. However, if you look at the mic. Regression rate is about roughly 23 percent, like one in four, which is fairly high. This series said clipping is useful for fistulas less than two centimeters, and fibrin glue is effective for thin and clean fistulas. Of course, there are lots of you know fine print, lots of things in the fine print, but this is the overall you know uh, message from this uh, systematic review. 
What about chronic fistulas? The leaks which become chronic. Again, the stents are not useful. That's been clearly shown. The clips and suturing show good images. Treatment of choice is endoscopic internal drainage. Either the pigtail, endoscopic vacuum therapy, septotomy, and drainage. These are, you know, this is a pigtail drain which is put through a nasal cavity, you know, nasal root endoscopically. And a septotomy is basically removing the septum using a needle knife to create a common cavity where you can wash the abscess cavity and irrigate it and put a, put a you know, catheter to drain. This is a summary of this, you know, uh, endoscopic management where early leaks are managed by stents or clips depending on the size. And the late leaks of the fistula are managed by septotomy, balloon dilatation, or internal drainage with a PVT. Now, coming to bleeding. Now, bleeding, uh, if you look at roughly the rate is again 1 to 2%. I think with the more, you know, more emphasis should be placed on prevention of this complication because, you know, leaks have decreased with careful attention to a lot of things, but bleeding is still a problem. And roughly the rate is between 1 to 2%. If last is cases, it was only 1.6%. Uh, so, where does the bleeding occur from? The staple line, the momentum, the short gastric vessels, the port side, or due to anticoagulation. And we are all aware how it presents tachycardia, hypotension, excessive drainage, increasing pallor and abdominal pain. Don't uh, you know, look at the drain. Don't depend on the drain. Drain may get blocked. I think the single most important factor is hypotension or abdomen. Abdomen can hide liters of blood without showing any other sign except hypotension. So if once the hypotension is there, please rule out bleeding as a cause. Management is conservative in most of the cases, resuscitation, stop the anticoagulation and do a serial hematocrit and close monitoring the arrange blood and transfuse the blood. And re-laparoscopy is required, especially if you have an early bleeding on the day of surgery, or the drain output is high, or the patient has persistent, you know, hypotension, which is really having a recurrent hypotension. One episode of hypotension, you transfuse blood, patient becomes stable, it's all right. But the patient has again a hypotension, please rush to OT and uh, re-laparoscope. There have been predictors in a recent study which have shown that the patient has a no history of OSC or no history of hypotension, there's a lower risk of bleeding. And the higher risk of bleeding is associated with no stipulated reinforcement and low level of surgical expertise. So prevention depends on careful hemostasis. Please prevent, spend enough time on checking the staple of hemostasis. That's probably the most important uh, step. You know, it can be done quickly, but sometimes enough time should spend on the hemostasis. Adequate compression time for the stapler. Withdraw the bougie before you check for bleeding. Ask the anesthetist about the blood pressure. You know, blood pressure should be around 140 millimeter of mercury or roughly or more than 30 percent above the, you know, the baseline to check for bleed. As and it has been shown to reduce the bleeding rate by one third. Again, staple and reinforcement has been clearly shown to reduce bleeding. However, it costs. Uh, it can uh, be in the form of overswing or buttressing material like, uh, you know, perish traps or singard. However, we have relied entirely on 200 millimeter clips. You guys, you can see in this photograph, there are roughly about eight to 10 clips. So if you're a patient and you sort of catch hold of the oozers, the bleeders, put 200 clips, this is probably the cheapest way to control bleeding. Again, I said, don't rely on the drains. They, they just sort of may lead in early detection, but doesn't prevent the complication. Food intolerance is really, you know, talked about. It's a very important issue of a sleep gastrectomy, and these are the various causes. An unrepaired hiatus hernia leading to a migration of the fundus, stricture, twisted sleep, and king. And, you know, these have been found to uh, be the important causes of food intolerance following falling sleep gastrectomy, which can occur early in the postoperative period or late, uh, you know, uh, as in a twisted fundus or a late stricture. So what is the ideology? I think the most important thing is, uh, which happens is we get too close to the incisora, or we are very aggressive about overswing of staple line. Like in our initial experience, overswing, we had some patients who presented and were readmitted with uh, severe nausea and vomiting. Uh, staple line overswing creates asymmetry, induces ischemia, and uh, can also cause leaks. So in our own experience, we have given up the overswing of staple line totally, completely. It doesn't help in leaks and it really uh, causes more problems than, uh, you know, benefits. So how do you prevent the stricture? So place the uh, bougie. So this is just a very small clip showing how we should be very careful about the first firing. Always place a bougie before the first firing. Don't, sometimes the 
it doesn't go, doesn't end up. Take your time, place the bougie. Placing the bougie. And even after you place the bougie, the tip of the stapler at the time of first fire should be away from the incisor, at least 2.5 centimeters as shown in this video, because there is an angulation there from the vertical to the horizontal part of the stomach. So even if you have a bougie, uh, this can result in kinking if you are too close to the bougie. As I already said, avoid overzealous overswing of the staple line or avoid any overswing at all as, a, as we practice. We don't practice any overswing. So once you do this, you see there is a enough, you know, uh, you know, width of the sleeve at the incisora, uh, and you know you are not really too close to uh, the this thing. So, what are the symptoms of uh, when when you when we say food intolerance? It can be in the form of recurrent vomiting, dysphagia, rapid weight loss, uh, weakness or vernix encephalopathy, and uh, you know one of the author described a combination of the bath symptoms like bloating, abdominal pain, regurgitation, and food intolerance. And how do you evaluate these symptoms? Now, don't psychological issues. I've seen you know some of the patients being treated with referred to a psychiatrist for these symptoms because they think you know uh, everything is normal. We have done a good sleep. Take a good dietary history. Some wrap you know uh, uh, leads to these sort of symptoms. However, we must investigate any sort of serious symptoms. Endoscopy is the first investigation, but maybe normal even in the presence of twist or king because the expert endoscopist can negotiate this twist or king. I would always recommend the surgeon to be endoscopy is done, or you can if you can do your own endoscopy, that would be wonderful. Barium studies are probably the investigation of choice, uh, or you can do a CD scan with CD reconstruction, or one may sometimes require diagnostic laparoscopy where adhesions, external adhesions can lead to a kink or a twist of sleep. And we have seen in one or two cases this has, this has happened. Uh, treatment is resuscitation. I won't go into details of that, but definitely management is eating behavior modification, endoscopic dilatation of any structure, repair of any hiatus hernia, uh, or, and surgery. Uh, if you're repairing hiatus hernia, maybe good idea to convert to RYGB or do a structure plaster, depending on the findings uh, of the case. Reflux is a you know real controversial issue, but it's become important. One of the long-term complications of sleeve is reflux, and some of the recent papers have mentioned a very high incidence of Barrett's. But our own data on more than 80 endoscopies, I think it's touching 100 now, has shown only one case with the you know in a biopsy proven Barrett's esophagus out of these and more than you know, roughly 90 endoscopies. So in our own experience, Barrett's is not an important issue. All the reflux is. And our philosophy is to be very aggressive about the hiatus hernia repair at the time of sleep. We roughly repair hiatus hernia in one in four cases. And I can show videos where hiatus hernia is so subtle. And if you dissect, you find a large defect. And you see hiatus hernia here, fundus is going migrating up. You know, there's a volume reflux uh, on the, you know, there's a twisting of the sleeve with reflux. So all these issues can occur if you do not pay attention to that technique. Again, most of the GERD do not require surgical treatment. Please remember that. It's 80 to 90% of these patients can be treated with just dietary modification, asking the patient to eat slowly, mindfully, give a trial of prokinetic agents and PPIs. And surgery is required in only limited cases. And so look at what are the indications of conversion. Uh, severe symptoms or objective scoring systems are available, especially nocturnal reflux. In our own experience, patients who have nocturnal reflux, when they lie down, they have a Food coming to their mouth, causing you know chronic cough and all that. Erosive esophagitis (LACD), volume reflux, as you can see on the picture on the right, and pH studies. All these things can uh, you know indicate a conversion. And I'll just show you a small video where to how we you know we do it. And today again we had a revision case where none of the investigations suggested a hiatus, but on on uh, you know proper dissection we found fundus going up. Patient had weight regain and we did convert to an MGB. Again, in this case, this patient was all flux. As you can appreciate, there's a large hiatus. We are dissecting the sleeve away from the left crust, large right crust. Meticulous dissection showing with the, you know fine uh, scissors and harmonic. You can dissect the hiatus, convert to a bypass in the standard way. We use the omega loop technique. Uh, you know, take 70 centimeters from DJ junction. Use a you know do cartridge in a revision case. Do a three centimeter anastomosis and close the entrotomy in a single layer using two zero PDS. And subsequently, you know, we detach the BP limb, then do a jejunostomy uh, at about 
130 centimeter from elementary elementary lip from the GJ. Again, using a uh, white cartridge here because this is you know virgin area, and close the common introtomy with two zero PDS. Following that, we close the mesenteric defects, and then we prepare. We just had the period without the buji, and the buji is required for the leak test. So we you know after we've done this. We so just skip. so this is a high test repair. So just two or three sutures with endo stitch or one zero proline is enough, uh, and uh, we ensure an adequate length of isovega and appreciate of three centimeters to the drain and come out. So this is uh, required in certain limited cases. Again, most of the GR patients can be managed conservatively. Uh, okay, I'll just go to the next slide. So how do, how do we minimize the reflux? You must pay attention to the sleep morphology. Avoid too narrow a sleep. You know, 38 to 40 French bougies or 34 French. As I said, pay close attention to piling the first stapler. Avoid any twists in the sleep. Repair the hydrous hernias, you know, which are clinically. And uh, so just to conclude my talk, uh, you know, my, Never, you know, ignore patient's condition. Patient doesn't look good. It may be like confusion, patient not looking very awake, hypoxia, tachypnea, uh, or all due to can be due to a leak. The symptoms of leak can present subtly and yet be rapidly fatal because this obese patient can have a very, you know, you know fast inflammatory response. So very close observation and decision making is required irrespective of the time of the day. If you do imaging, read films together with the radiologist. Our protocol is immediately consult the consultant radiologist and discuss the films with them. Again, explore or relap as soon as possible or drain the collection as soon as possible. And do not let anyone in the team suggest, you know, more imaging, more, you know, uh, you're waiting for the next day and saying, you know, patient looks all right. The best diagnostic test is relaparoscopy. Don't forget that. If you ever put the imaging, the imaging is and the clinical findings are not matching. Going for a real laparoscopy, you will never regret. Don't over rely on imaging, especially if negative. Again, do not let the sunset on obstruction applies here as well. And you should do a prompt real laparoscopy without regard to any convenience, schedule, or sleep time. You know, denial is dangerous and delay lethal. So, if you want to prevent it, uh, minimize the complications, always tell the patient what the complications can be. You know, counsel the patient that if they have fever. Give them their phone numbers, whom to contact, if they have persistent vomiting, severe pain. So they know they should know when to call the surgeon on how to reach their surgical team. Thank you. I hope I have finished in time, roughly about 20 minutes, uh, 22 minutes. And this I invite you to this course uh, basically for postgraduates in various medical colleges and various other centers, which is a one and a half day course on basics of bariatric surgery. I know Sir Faraj is doing an advanced course in bariatric surgery. In in Calcutta, but this is a basic course in bariatric surgery. Uh, we are looking at about roughly about 50 participants, and we are planning to give them complimentary accommodation as well in Delhi. Uh, and it will be a nice course which will show we show all the three basic procedures, discuss each procedures, you know, the history, the technique, the complications, and the counseling, the dietary part. So it will be a nice, you know, basic course. Roughly, whoever is interested, please, you know, contact me or email at uh at you know our forms website uh, thank you so much uh, i'm open to questions now that was a wonderful talk dr sandeep as usual i think you covered the complete aspects of the prevention to management of uh, sleep complications and uh, i mean there's to start off with i think you have a large experience in bariatric surgery and sleep gastrectomy for the last uh, decade or so i mean over because the sleep complications continue to be there including leak which is probably the most dreaded complication. So what has been your learning curve in the way you have done your sleep gastrectomy since you started until now? And what would you be your advice to the young surgeons who are starting up with sleep gastrectomy? That's an extremely good question, I think. And uh, if you look at some of the, you know, all of us know that the sleep changed over the last one decade. Uh, when we started and now where, where we are, there are a lot of things which we have changed. And one thing which I have learned from my learning curve is don't be too aggressive about the tightness of sleep. It doesn't give you more weight loss. It only gives you complications. That is point number one. Don't take sleep as a simple operation. 
today when I, we had a sleep at about 3 3:30 i thought i'll finish in within 1 hour believe me it was really one of the toughest sleeves i did today the whole funda was stuck posterior don't take sleeve as a simple procedure it has its own nuances each fire planet where to put it equal attraction on both anterior and posterior surfaces be very meticulous about the hemostasis and what i have you no know, what has changed in our practice is not to be aggressive at the upper part of the sleeve don't dissect the angle of fat at angle is too aggressively unless it's too large probably that is one thing i think i have changed which has probably led to you know luckily last two two to three years we didn't have don't didn't have a leak and one thing i can think of is do not dissect the fat at the angle of is too much because that leads to hematoma besides other things besides you know all other points i've talked about I and mean, these are my learning lessons uh which i think i've learned of course there are a lot of things uh, i think the hydrocele repair which i mentioned in the presentation we were not aggressive about it earlier but now if you dissect it nicely you see it's, it's fairly you know even an occult looking hydras once you dissect it it's fairly large and it just takes another 10 minutes fairly regularly don't ignore the hydras it's going to lead to reflux later on and then everybody blames that sleep for reflux so repair the hydras learn to how to repair it along with sleep gas check tell me my you know answer to Oh, great, uh, great points and great learnings for the young system. Deep. Now, I think going on to leak as such. Let us let us say, for example, a surgeon who's in his early curve of his career has done a sleep gastrectomy. He notices leak like uh, on the fourth or the fifth day post sleep gastrectomy. Uh, but what I mean, he has. Let's say, for example, he hasn't managed a sleep leak earlier. So, what should he do? So, should he do something on his own along with the medical gastro that he's working with? Or should he intervene, or should he refer to another surgical center, or should he seek help? What will be your advice, be? Yeah, again, a great question. So, as, as if you look at our own experience, uh, most of the leaks are small because if we are, if we have been treated a blunder, you know, misfired a step or totally, most of the leaks are small. They present usually, as I said, four to fifth day. They lead to a localized collections, and patients are usually hemodynamic stable unless you know we have delayed the diagnosis or untrained, not trained the sepsis. So, first thing first. drain the sepsis right away i mean there's no time left if you diagnose leave at 10 o'clock drain it within the next few hours either by re laparoscopy but if you have a good endometrial radiologist we have drained our collection even at night because at aims we have a very good department of radiology but if you don't have it go go drain it at night don't wait till morning point number 1 so there you don't need to refer any patient please if you are a bariatric surgeon you are supposed to have good laparoscopic skills you can drain it point number 1 don't Uh, you know, if you are not sure about feeding gastrostomy, how to do it? It's easily said. You know, say do a feeding gastrostomy. It's not an easy procedure laparoscopically in a obese patient. So if you can't do it, don't do it. You can put always put a feeding tube later on. If you can do it, nice. But if you can't do it properly, don't you know try to do it. So and and start antibiotics promptly. So if it is a controlled leak, you can get away with the initial period, and then you can talk to other colleagues. uh depending on and if you have the expertise of the gastroenterologist get it stented uh, we are not a great believer in stenting uh, but yes stents have come have come up better stents are available patients ask for it because they will ask the other surgeons across the city once the leak is happened believe me it's an it's, it's a very difficult situation for the surgeon be honest with the patient i that's the best thing so there's a leak it happened we have we have already told you pre operatively i already told you it takes four to six weeks for heal so if you have counseled the patient well no need to panic you have not committed a crime or something there's a leak manage it well talk to the patient morning evening see the patient communication patient will realize himself or herself that you are being you are committed to their you know recovery so i think referral can come later on i mean if there's you know you have to manage it initially this is my you know take on it okay so at 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 what point in a in a sleep leak management would you Consider that the endoscopic therapies are not working well. That would want to intervene if the surgical approach. Yeah. So uh, as I said, if you look at uh, the approach, it can be conservative approach without stent or with stents. And most of them have a certain success rate. They don't have a hundred percent success rate. But let's say about seventy-five to ninety percent in the best of the hands. So remaining ten to fifteen, twenty percent would require some sort of surgery. uh it may include a total gastrectomy or or a conversion to bypass if it's not very high so i think those are left to the best left to the trained surgeons or very experienced surgeons so i would 
if you are a, you know not you know very experienced refer then case that's the time for referral because these are extremely complex cases we had last week we we required we took the help of gi surgeons because it was really complex uh, almost 3 months later it you know patient presented again with a really leak, small leak but when it was sepsis controlled and we had to do a laparotomy believe me sir it's a very difficult situation don't do it yourself take the help of a senior gi surgeon or or a senior surgeon or a colleague i think that's the time for referral because then you need a surgical management the endoscopic management okay. great great thoughts dr sandeep and great learnings uh, does any of the other moderators have any questions for dr sandeep can i ask one question pravin so please sir go ahead uh, sandeep excellent presentation thank you uh, uh, one question regarding that uh, revision uh, uh, thing with uh, hiatus hernia uh, should hiatus hernia or hiatal defect should always be prepared or you can repair uh, while you are making gastric pouch sorry i missed the, the voice became a bit, you know. okay so i will repeat the yeah. yeah so when there is a hiatus hernia with uh, weight regain after sleeve yeah should hiatus hernia be repaired only after doing gastric bypass or you can repair earlier also you can repair while you are doing the gastric pouch and then go back, uh, then go for the jejunal yeah. thing so as i said uh, we repair the hiatus hernia without a buji and normally we require the buji for the leak test that's the only point so if you can do it after gj itself once you remove the buji so our you know we, we have developed a step wise approach like today's revision again uh, first dissect the sleeve right till the hiatus identify the left crust look whether the fundus is going up which is almost always there believe me some fundus is always going up in vitre in cases get it down get a good length of esophagus convert to mgb or rvg depending on you know what is the primary indication if it is reflux it's rvgb if it's weight in is mgb do all the steps of the bypass repair the hiatus and that's our approach that's just just because we don't want to do it yeah. thank you um any questions from any of the moderators uh if not i think i think that was a great session i think that was a great start for ihs prime time i'm sure all of you would watch this would have definitely enjoyed the presentation and the discussion thank you thank you dr sandeep agarwal once thank again for that wonderful presentation over thank to dr so kanagwel for the rest of the, the session thank, thank you. you all the all the faculty thanks thank you dr pravin uh in a special uh, to be moderated by a eminent bariatric surgeon and spoke, being spoken by an eminent bariatric surgeon on this important area of the cataract now we move on to the next important issue uh now we have uh, none other than uh, a surgeon who has done 7000 plus bariatric operations over the last 20 years the director of the bariatric and abdomen and uh, also operating from rajkot he is one of the very few surgeon of excellence certified by the american society of metabolic and bariatric surgery and uh, he takes special interest in uh, training youngsters into the field of bariatric operation and i am sure with 7000 uh, surgeries plus to his uh, credit we are going to have a very dynamic uh, moderation i am sure we are also having to listen to his experience during moderation can i have dr sanjay patolia sir to moderate this session thank you dr kanagoel for uh, kind introduction i must uh, congratulate first of all the iags team for starting uh, this iags prime time uh, i am very much sure that this team under leadership of professor sunil sunil popat will do a uh, well in scientific activity uh, <clears throat> today we are going to i am moder- i am going to moderate a session on complications when by gastric bypass uh, present it is to be presented by uh, respected dr uh, kulasar dr kulasar doesn't need any uh, much introduction because uh, he uh, is a well known bariatric surgeon he is uh, with uh, respected dr chobe sir working in the team and uh, 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 as far as i know the team is uh, very much uh, 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 
comfortable with performing ru and y gastric bypass if not wrong exclusively from beginning so dr khula can uh, give better idea about complication of ru and y gastric bypass having wide experience of treating patients with ru and y gastric bypass uh, uh, we know ru and y gastric bypass is considered to be gold standard procedure in bariatric procedure so uh, everyone must understand complications of ru and y gastric bypass as well so i must uh, welcome uh, dr rajesh kula sir to present uh, his uh, views and ideas on complications of ru and y gastric bypass please sir over to you thank you thank you dr sanjay patolia and i must thank uh, the president uh, professor smil popat Uh, convener dr kanagwel as well as the secretary igs ishu murthy thank you it's been a wonderful uh, you know initiative by igs which has become very popular and has been spreading the knowledge in different fields of uh, endoscopic laparoscopic surgery uh, and i congratulate uh, the leadership of igs for taking up this initiative and i thank uh, sunil i thank kanagwel for inviting me for this uh, session on uh, complication of arthritis i'll uh, share my screen i bring greetings from the max institute of laparoscopic endoscopic and bariatric surgery max tech new delhi complication cannot be entirely eliminated but early recognition and intervention can greatly improve the outcomes that is one of the most important thing every surgeon should understand if a surgeon says that he has never done any complication either he has not done enough surgery or he is lying because complica complication can happen even in the best of the hands so it is very important to uh, recognize the complication early to improve the outcomes it is more apt in bariatric surgery because bariatric surgery is technically much more complex because these patients are complex patients they may not have any comorbidity uh, like diabetes hypertension but just their excess weight makes them a complex patient itself along with that they are more prone to have comorbidities also like diabetes hypertension sleep apnea so all these conditions also make them more prone for developing complications now after rygb the complications can be early or late and any complication in these patients they are challenging the main reason for that is because there is no normal physiological response to the intra abdominal sepsis the intra abdominal fat as well as the subcutaneous fat being so much it becomes very difficult to do a proper physical examination to really find out the catastrophe which has happened in abdomen these patients are difficult to undergo imaging studies and because the patient's weight may be so much that your ct scan machine may not be able to handle that patient all these things they lead uh, to delay in diagnosis and management and the most important thing in a bariatric patient is the early diagnosis and early management so what is necessary for this is to minimize the morbidity we need a vigilant team bariatric surgery is a team work of anesthetist surgeon the intensivist the physiotherapist nutritionist now this team has to be very vigilant and when you see a patient if you don't find anything happening in a normal way Uh, you should be suspicious so high index of suspicious is very important and the most important is to have a low threshold for re exploration believe me 
even a negative re-exploration on high suspicion will not cause any increased morbidity to the patient. But if there is a problem, early exploration will always be rewarded. Now, the early post-operative phase, the different complications which can occur, as uh, very aptly uh, you know, told by Dr. Sandeep also after leak, uh, after sleeve uh, surgery, after Ru and Y gastric bypass also, you can have leak. The incidence ranges between uh, 0 0.09 to 8.36. There could be a bleeding hemorrhage, which ranges from 0.1 to 4. There could be bowel obstruction, uh, or there could be a pulmonary embolism, which can happen after any bariatric surgery. Now, if you see these patients on the first post-op day, when you go for the round, you usually find that patient has minimal pain. Uh, there would be a serous fluid in the drain discharge if you have put in a drain. If there's no drain, it doesn't matter. The urine output is adequate. There is no tachycardia. There is no tach tachypnea. The BP is stable. Uh, normally, when we go in the morning round, the patient is sitting up reading the newspaper or talking to the relatives or taking a walk in the corridor uh, in our recovery room. So these are the patients who are doing well and everything is going fine. But if there are different patients who is, uh, when you go for the round, you see that there is tachycardia. The pulse may be more than 100 or 110. Now remember the tachycardia for a person whose basal pulse was 60 during surgery, even 80 or 90 would be tachycardia. And if the basal pulse was 100 during surgery, even 110 would be a normal pulse for that. So you have to take tachycardia uh, with the basal uh, pulse rate which the patient had during surgery. Tachypnea and respiratory symptom. Patient is, you can see patient using the accessory muscle to breathe. May or may not complain of abdominal pain. Fever may or may not be there. But the most important is the anxious look on the patient. Patient is not looking happy. You know, uh, you ask him, he says, I'm not really feeling too good. I have this problem. I have that problem. You know? So this should raise the high, uh, the suspicion should be there in the mind of the surgeon. Unexplained tachycardia. And normally we send the uh, counts and the hemoglobin early in the morning at six o'clock. And slight rise in the leucos leukocyte count is normal, but a significant rise in leukocytes. Dehydration, the tongue is dry, patient is tachypneic and the urine output is low. If you find these features, this warrants something to be done. In these patients, if these are the symptoms on day one, I think the best thing would be to do a re-laparoscopy in these patients, because if re-laparoscopy is done within 24 hours, the patient recovers as a normal post-operative patient. Yes, there is a role of uh, doing a CT scan or doing a dye study, but doing that, you will waste eight to 10 hours in getting those investigations done. Because as I said, it is not very easy to get the imaging done in these patients. So real laparoscopy is very, very important. And during real laparoscopy, you identify the leak, and as we have gone early, usually it is possible to suture, do a thorough lavage and put drains if you have not put before. If you have put one, put another one. And after bypass, the best thing is that you have the remnant stomach in which you can do a feeding gastrostomy, which is not a very difficult procedure as compared to a feeding genostomy. This helps in initial decompression of the remnant stomach and maybe after 48 hours you can start feeding through this gastrostomy to maintain the nutrition of the patient. This is the patient uh, which we had to go in on the day one. 
and this is the finding you can see the striking feature is that in this you don't find any bile as compared to the, the you know other leaks uh, there is no bile in the gastrojejunal leak you see the clear fluid and that's the gastrojejunosme and that's the perforation you can see you will see a spurt of fluid coming out of it so it's a early perforation you can see the suture that's the staple line it is at the junction of uh, gastrojejunal anastomosis the tissues are not that bad they are holding the sutures so with uh, the 20 vicryl or uh, and once you have closed the perforation it is not very difficult to do a gastrostomy the remnant stomach is just lying by the side take a first string suture put in a foley's catheter and that's what needs to be done and the patient uh, usually recovers without any even another leak can occur from is the jejunal jejunostomy although leak from jejunal jejunostomy is very very rare this is the only one leak we have had till now in last 20 years uh, from the jejunal jejunostomy and the reason is always hydrogenic i would say in jejunal jejunostomy leak you will see bile you know because uh, jejunal jejunostomy you have the elementary limb and you have the biliopancreatic limb here, so the bile will always be there so if you see bile there you know that the leak is not in the gastrojejunal anastomosis but near the jejunum so you have to see and you see this is also done on day 1 that is why there is not much of edema in the bowel you see the perforation on the posterior wall of the jejunum and usually <clears throat> this perforation occurs if you are not very careful when you are doing and making the endrotomy in the jejunum or if you are too enthusiastic in uh, attaining hemostasis at the suture line and the important thing is going early you are able to close the perforation properly and in this patient this was all was what was necessary proper suction of the pus as well as putting in drains in the upper abdomen as well as in the pus. this usually takes care of the leak and patient normally recovers now the leak can also occur in the later phase which is delayed leak which usually occurs from 5 to 7 days after surgery usually by this time the patient is back home <clears throat> and the presentation is pain fever and left hypochondriac pain and on investigation you have leukocytosis and in this you must do a ccct scan and which shows a left hypochondriac lesion uh, the management would be uh, depending upon the size of the collection you can do a ct guided drainage or you can do a relaparoscopic drain and just do a feeding gastrostomy at this stage it is impossible to put sutures at the uh, perforation site and usually these patients with good feeding uh, and good nutrition they usually heals in 2 to 3 weeks because as compared to the sleeve leak a uh, root and vice bypass is a low pressure system there is no high pressure in the <coughs> pouch so the perforation usually heals quickly second important complication is hemorrhage hemorrhage can occur intraluminal or it can be intra abdominal now the diagnosis is very important and it depends on the presentation how the bleeding presents it can present as hematemesis then the bleeding is either from the gj anastomosis or sometimes even gastric pouch bleeding if it is significant it can come in the elementary limb and present as hematemesis patient may have malina 
If melina is there, then the bleeding can occur from GJ, it can occur from pouch, it can occur from remnant, or it can occur from jejunal jejunostomy. If there is bright red color per rectum, then it has to be a massive jejunal jejunal bleeding. And if you have blood in the drain, then it is intra-abdominal average. Now, the treatment depends on the severity of hemorrhage. Uh, usually, it's a low volume and frequency. And the, if the drop in hemoglobin is less than 2 gram, and the patient is hemodynamically stable, the management will only be that stop low molecular weight heparin and transfuse blood if hemoglobin is less than 8 you may have to transfuse one, two, or three units of blood. Most important thing is the hemodynamically stable patient. If the bleeding or hematemesis is more, repeated episodes and large volume, whether it is hematemesis or malina, and patient shows signs of hypotension, and the fall in hemoglobin is more than two grams, this warrants management. If it's uh, hematemesis, then upper GI endoscopy and control of bleeding. And if it is uh, malina, then relaparoscopy and over sewing of all potential sites and all suture lines have to be done. The point to remember is that if you are doing upper GI endoscopy, then after that, a contrast study is a must to rule out any perforation which can occur if endoscopy is done in early phase. Extraluminal bleeding depends uh, if the hemodynamically uh, dynamically patient how is behaving. If the patient is stable, you continue conservative treatment. If the patient is not stable, you must re laparoscope. And this is a patient uh, we had to re laparoscope, and the site of bleeding was from the remnant. Uh, the risk uh, had formed a pseudo aneurysm uh, underrun the bleeder and uh, this is a flow seal which you can put on all the suture line to make sure because many times when you do laparoscopy in these patients, the bleeding has already stopped. So you must make sure that there is no further bleeding from the suture line. Another important early complication is bowel obstruction uh, which can happen in the hernia if the patient has. Many of these patients have a small all apical hernia which is not visible clinically or they can develop hernia, hernia of the bowel at the port side or there could be some anastomotic narrowing leading to bowel obstruction. Now it is uh, important to close the umbilical hernia if you have one uh, even if it was not present clinically because once you divide the omentum in the in the two-third, one-third region for the bypass for the elementary limb to go up. The bowel is exposed to the anterior abdominal wall. Momentum is not there in between. So the bowel has a tendency to herniate in the uh, small umbilical hernia. So it must be suture closed. Uh, we do not advocate putting in the mesh, but we always advocate the umbilical hernia should be closed and all 10 millimeter pores and the bowel should be suture closed. Pulmonary embolism is also an early uh, complication. The incidence is 0.8% ranging from 0.4 to 2.24. And this is one of the leading cause of mortality after bariatric surgery. Uh, fortunately, this is not very common, but it does happen occasionally, very rarely. Uh, the symptoms are usually tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, and hypoxemia. The investigations are ventilation, perfusion, scan, CT, pulmonary angiography, and echo to diagnose this condition. And the treatment is basically anticoagulation in the form of heparin and ventilatory port. But mortality and morbidity is very high in these patients. These patients and prevention is the main key uh, in these cases. And DVT prophylaxis is of utmost importance in bariatric patients. Early embolation, uh, lower extremity compression, uh, which is used during surgery also, and pharmacotherapy uh, in the form of low molecular weight heparin, 
all these three things are must in every bariatric patient to prevent from complication of pulmonary embolism so summarizing the post operative complications are the major cause of morbidity and mortality uh, fortunately these complications are much much less and uh, within acceptable limits uh, limited diagnostic modalities are available in these patients so a very high degree of suspicion by alert team is the key factor and early detection and immediate intervention minimizes the mortality and morbidity in these patients and i end my presentation by saying that the aim of science is not to attain infinite wisdom but to eliminate the potential of infinite errors thank you very much thank you very much for enlightening uh, with your talk in regards of complications of ruen y gastric bypass you have sir very well explained about the management of leak in case of ruen y gastric bypass specifically from uh, uh, pouch jejunal anastomosis leak as well as jejunal jejunal anastomosis leak so what uh, you have shown is relaparoscopy is uh, helping in managing leaks after ruen y gastric bypass sir we would like to know whether uh, endoscopic stenting in case of leak from pouch jejunal anastomosis from either from vertical staple line or from anastomotic staple line would be helpful or when you you consider for uh, is there any chance to consider for endoscopic stenting uh, you see endoscopic stenting is good for flea leaks uh, because uh, you want to convert high pressure system to a low pressure system now ruen y gastric bypass is a low pressure system and it's a small pouch and uh, stents i don't think have much role to play uh, in case of uh, gj leaks after a ruen y gastric bypass i think uh, the important thing to understand is that uh, you know if you were diagnose it early the early closure of the perforation gives you the best results if you put in a stent the stent migration is very high in these patients so i don't think there is much role of stent after a gj leak in bypass recently i was uh, discussing with our endoscopic colleagues and he was suggesting about uh, uh, anti migratory beta stent which he was very much hopeful about it and uh, he was suggesting and trying to uh, uh, endoscopic stent uh in case of uh, leak trick leak where patient is uh, vitally uh, vitally stable so that is i think opening up a new era for managing uh, 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 gastric leak uh, after rny gastric bypass and uh, you have beautifully shown about managing jejunal jejunal anastomotic leak sir any advice to prevent jejunal jejunal leak uh, specifically for the beginners because you told that it is mainly iatrogenic leak when it comes to jejunal jejunal leak in ruen y gastric bypass yeah you see the most important if you uh, people who are doing bypass you have to do endoscopy in uh, two limbs of jejunum to pass your stapler now endoscopy is done either using cautery or using the ultra cision now if you are using cautery if you are not careful sometimes your activated hook can touch the posterior wall without your knowledge and that can uh, you know cause later on uh, leak so when you are doing uh, endoscopy for making a jejunal jejunal anastomosis it is very important for your assistant to hold the loop well uh, put the loop under traction so that it is you only go puncture the interior wall of the jejunum on both the loops and then you enter second very important thing is once you have passed your stapler both the limbs you must lift up before you fire you must lift up your stapler so that the posterior part of the posterior wall mucosa doesn't come into your stapler you see it is not easy to put your scope inside the anastomosis to look at the inner anastomotic line you see only the outer anastomotic line 
so what the stapler has done inside you have to be careful so always lift up your stapler before you fire and make sure that your uh, staple your uh, two limbs of the staple are anvil and the staple are freely moving in the jejunal loops before you fire they, this, this is very important to prevent any injury iatrogenic injury in the jejunal because otherwise there is no reason for jejunal general anastomosis to leak and uh, what you saw in the video that was not from the anastomotic line it was little away from the uh, stable line so and this is the only one which we had <laughs> yeah it's very rare operation yeah. yeah and sometimes in case of struggle uh, we may injure uh, the intestinal lumen, intestinal wall with the tip of uh, stapler yeah. that yeah. and that's also important factor which we need to take care about yeah. absolutely Sir, uh, regarding intestinal obstruction, internal hernia is very uh, uh, important factor which, which we should never forget. So we would like to have some uh, 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 advice or some uh, tips uh, or what your what is your practice to prevent internal hernia that I think every beginner or every junior surgeon who wants to start bariatric program, they must understand and they should not neglect it. Yeah. You see, I didn't discuss internal hernia because that complication usually occurs little late. Once the patient has lost some weight, then the internal hernia, there is more tendency for internal hernia to develop. Normally, what we have seen, we have seen internal hernia occurring after three to six months, earliest after three to six months of uh, Ru and Y gastric bypass. It is 100% importance that both the jejunal jejunal as well as the Peterson defects should be closed. Uh, why I am saying so is because uh, we, when we started our bariatric program, there were reports, uh, you know, whether you close or you don't close, the incidence of hernia is same. So we were not closing. Okay, so after four years of doing number of bariatric patients, we started getting our share of internal hernia. So we started getting internal hernia from the jejunal jejunal defect. We got four or five of them in a row. Then we thought, no, no, we must close the jejunal jejunal defect. Peterson doesn't occur. So we started closing jejunal jejunal defect. After two, three years of that, we started getting Peterson hernia internal hernias. So we have experienced from our own personal learning, we have learned that both the defects should be closed. That is the only safeguard to reduce. And we have uh, even published a paper in obesity surgery, our experience, uh, that closure of both the defects definitely reduces the incidence of internal hernia. Because we have seen internal hernias and we have had all, uh, you know, share early presentation, late presentation, two cases we had to do massive gut resection to save the patient. But most of the cases, uh, we could reduce the hernia in time and salvage the patients. But the internal hernia, you must close both the defects. Very, very important. True, sir. So majority of surgeons who are now strongly believing to close both the defects, they have the same experience which you have mentioned. Uh, so that's very important to understand the closure of both the defects. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, a uh, uh, gastric bypass is very well established uh, for the weight maintenance effect as compared to uh, other procedure, I mean the restrictive procedure. So uh, uh, do you think banded procedure can give uh, better results in terms of weight maintenance as compared to non-banded bypass? Uh, yes, that is a very important question. Uh, I have my reservation about the band. Uh, we started our bariatric program with the uh, gastric band, you know that. And uh, a time came when we had to remove all those gastric bands. The banded band placed over the pouch in uh, RYGB is a very loose, uh, you know, band, which does not even encircle, there is always a gap between the pouch. Now, I am not able to understand uh, that how this place band, which is not causing any obstruction or any, uh, you know, pouch is not dilated as yet, 
but still banded bypass gives better results in first six months as compared to non-banded. I do not know how it happens. The day that band starts making its effect for not letting the pouch to dilate, it will cause erosion and will come inside the stomach. So there are enough reports of bands being eroded into the gastric pouch in which banded bypass has done. Uh, the weight regain after UN bypass is, has got multifaceted factors, which include from eating habits, the patient's habitat, the eating habits, the size of the pouch, I would say it's much more important. Size and the volume of the pouch is much more important as compared to placing a band around the pouch uh, for maintenance of it. That is my personal view. There may be different people. There are so many people who are in favor of even putting a band on the sleeve. I do not see uh, the logic <laughs> putting a band on the sleeve. But there are, so there are, you will find uh, different people, different surgeons experimenting and that is the only way to progress, I would say. If you don't do odd things, you don't find, you will not come across with new things. But my personal feeling is that a foreign body placed around a narrow tube, once the tube starts dilating, that band will erode inside the stomach. The purpose of band will go. So that is why we have not started putting band. We have not put till now even a single band. Uh, we are doing standard ruin y gastric bypass, small pouch, uh, 30 ml pouch, and we have good results. I'm quite happy with that. True. Sir, last question I would like to ask about reversibility of the gastric bypass. Gastric bypass is reversible procedure. Yes. Sir, we would like to know about the indications uh, where you you selected your patient for a complete reversal. Yeah. Uh, two patients we reversed when patient came with internal hernia. We did a massive resection and reversed the bypass. And patient recovered well, did well. One patient we had to reverse because patient could not tolerate bypass. There was uh, excessive weight loss and the patient could not manage uh, with the bypass and we had to reverse it. We have reversed only three patients till now of bypass. And that is the only, that has been only the indications. So, Two were uh, to save the life because uh, once you have done a massive resection, small bowel resection, uh, there was only uh, two meters of uh, one and a half meter of bowel left. So we reversed the, we did a gastrogastrostomy, fire stapler gastrogastrostomy pouch to the remnant stomach. And uh, same thing was done in this last patient who had come down from 120 kg to 45 kg and uh, could not maintain herself. So we reversed it. And she's doing well. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your uh, 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 enlightening session on complications. And uh, with answers to our questions, we got uh, detailed information. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Kanagawel, Dr. Sunil Popat, for the uh, scientific program. Thank you very much. Any more? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sunil. It was a wonderful uh, session. Thank you, uh, Sunil. Thank you, Kanagwil. And thank you, everyone who is participating in this session for this wonderful program. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Kullar. Always uh, your teaching is uh, excellent and we all enjoy it. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh Kullar. Uh, it's been a a lot of learning for us in such a short Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. It's been a pleasure having you as a moderator for this program. Uh, considering the time, I take your permission to move on to the next session. Uh, now we have uh, the pleasant honor of uh, inviting the president of the OSSI, uh, none other than uh, Dr. Manish Ketan. And uh, Manish Ketan himself being a gold medalist 
during his MS from the Gujarat University, and uh, who has done 4,000 plus bariatric procedures to his credit, and more so, the No Obesity Center at the KD Hospital has also been uh, pioneering in the follow-up of this patient, either done by that center or done by any other center, where the follow-up of bariatric surgery is a lifetime marriage with the patient and the bariatric team. The concept has been assimilated and uh, created and has been successfully maintained by uh, the BD hospital, KD hospital team. Dr. Manish has been trained at the University of California and uh, Professor Higa, the most eminent bariatric surgeon of that particular time of the time period. And uh, he has borne the torch of uh, learning from the California to the benefit of our country and the benefit of our fellowship students. The amount of students which he has been trained in the last 20 years prove or uh, has proven well the amount of uh, strict training which has been imparted by Dr. Manish Kaitan. And uh, during his tenure, OSSI also has uh, seen greater heights. They've had their own journals started up. A lot of uh, exciting academics happening on OSSI. And IGS, our leadership, our president has been instrumental in bringing the fellow societies to our ambit so that the academic wins. May I have the honor of inviting Dr. Manish Kaitan to moderate this session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gungabai, and thank you, Dr. Popat and IGS for inviting me. So without wasting much time, I would like to introduce one of my very good friends and immediate past president of OSSI, who has been a pioneer in not only bariatric surgery, but robotic surgery. And being since in the capital of our country, uh, you know, a lot of people have attention, have learned from him, and those are the days when I started bariatric surgery. I see him talking about complications on band. So he's one of the senior fellows who has got quite good experience and he is also the president of the society of MGB. Uh, that is OAGB now, one anastomotic, one, anastomotic, one anastomotic gastric bypass. So I invite Dr. Arun Prashad and the FRCS to talk on complication of one anastomotic gastric bypass. So, Arun, all to you. Thank you, Manish, for those kind words. And nice to see you and nice to see everybody else. Congratulations to Sunil and the entire IAGS team for this wonderful prime time series, which now has become quite a popular event and we all look forward to it every fortnight. So I'll get on with my topic, which is on the complications of MGB, OAGB. So I'll start with my screen share. So when we talk about MGB, OAGB complications, we could divide these into intraoperative, early post-operative, delayed post-operative, and late complications. The intraoperative complications can start with bleeding in the lesser curve entry. So the first step which we do during MGB is entering the lesser curve. And while entering, you can encounter some bleeding, which can be annoying. Hence, it's very important to patiently take this step because once you've made this opening, after this, the chances of bleeding reduces. Then, at the same time, you can also cause an injury in the lesser curve while you are trying to make this window. So, this first step can be of a problem and one should not be in a hurry to start off. So, be gentle, be patient. As soon as you have opened this window, the rest of the procedure becomes relatively easier. Then, while making the pouch, you can have stapler failure. Next problematic area is towards the end of your pouch making, the sleeve which you are making. And that is when you are doing a retro fundal stapling. So you can get bleeding there. Now, many MGB surgeons would say that there is no point in uh, dissecting out that area and we keep firing our stapler till we reach the end, even if you don't disconnect, it's not a problem. But I think here, personally, I feel that going by the RYGB experience, one should 
bring the fundus down by opening up the area under the diaphragm that peritoneum because once you bring the fundus down then this retrofundal dissection becomes easy and the chances of your bleeding in that area near the spleen gets reduced so bring the fundus down like you do in rygb make a window there and fire the stapler to reduce these chances twisted pouch is another problem i think this has been dealt with nicely by previous speaker during the sleeve and you need to avoid twisting of the pouch because a twisted pouch can give rise to a lot of post operative symptoms so when you are firing your stapler make sure that your stapler is coming on the top a little bit of anti clockwise twist of your gun is what is required so i'll take you through a few videos interesting videos now this is an mgb which has been completed we have just done a leak test and what do we see here that's methylene blue coming out of the efferent limb of the mgb now this has happened because the assistant who was holding on to this uh, limb while we were doing the surgery has probably been over uh, powerful and has made a hole there so importance of doing a leak test here is not just the anastomosis but it can help you identify other coincidental bowel injury that might have taken place during your surgery without your knowledge so we have now sutured that uh, hole and we did another leak test and this seemed fine so there was no problem then this is another interesting case this is a robotic mgb going on the mgb pouch has been formed the jejunum is being taken up and we do a gastro jejunostomy after doing the gastro jejunostomy we start suturing and ask for the gct to be passed but the gct is not going through the anastomosis even though it was a 6 cm 60 mm wide anastomosis so what's wrong and suddenly we find what's this so what has happened here there is the anastomosis but the gct is on the left so what happened is that once we made the pouch this patient had a very floppy stomach and fundus up there and the fundus flopped down the omentum is hiding the actual pouch and it is the fundus which is lying up so what i did was i pulled that fundus down and did world's first fundo jejunostomy so now to correct it we've done a excision of that and a small roux limb has been created so this roux limb is now being an astomost and what we are doing is a some sort of a diverted mgb gct is now passed nicely across this the astomosis is closed the extra segment is excised we do a jejuno jejunostomy to complete the ruin why another case here here what we see is after the leak test we see this white spot so how did this happen this was probably the cause that when you make the entrotomy with the harmonic there the tip has probably gone and touched the opposite side and this could have led to a delayed perforation ischemic perforation at a later date <clears throat> so what next as this has been identified all we did was 
did a serosa to serosa suturing to bury that white spot. Early post-operative, we can have a gastrojejunostomy leak or we can have bleeding. Now, gastrojejunostomy leak in MGB causes biliary peritonitis. So, this is something which goes in its favor or it goes against. That's something a matter of debate. But all I can say is that if there is a GJ leak, a biliary peritonitis, it's going to be picked up very fast because the patient is going to be in tremendous pain. So, the diagnosis of this GJ leak is clinical and whenever that happens, patient is in agony and pain and you immediately know that this is perhaps a GJ leak because of the features of biliary peritonitis. I thank Dr. Sarfraz Bey for allowing me to show this video and here you can see an early diagnosis of biliary leak. Uh, from the MGB anastomosis. So it was diagnosed early and hence they were able to suture nicely and the patient did well. Next, as we've got a, a long staple line as on the sleeve pouch, there is always a possibility of a staple line bleed. I thank Dr. Tantia for allowing me to share this video of his. And what you can see there is a bleeder there. So with some wash, extra suction cannula. The bleeder is identified. Controlled with a combination of clips and overrunning of the staple line. Here is another case leak, as you can see. And after going in, we find that the anastomosis is fairly clear. There is no leakage from the gastrojejunal anastomosis. So that creates a confusion. So then we go up further, ask the anesthetist to pass the gastric calibration tube again and put in some methylene blue dye and what you see here is a leakage from the sleeve pouch much above the area of our anastomosis. So it's not necessary that you will get leak from the anastomosis. You can also get leak from the Sleeve pouch is the message from this particular video. So suture and lavage and drain. Talking about delayed post-operative complications, hypoglycemia like any bypass is a problem and that is to be managed by patient education, modification of diet, giving small meals, giving certain supplements, dumping also forms the same uh, group, can give a carbos and there are many methods of handling this problem. So hypoglycemia and dumping are inherent and these are some symptoms which the patient can face. Diarrhea can happen mainly because of the uh, malabsorption part. It will happen more if you have bypassed a longer segment. Then patient often complains of vague abdominal pains. So whenever a patient complains of vague abdominal pain, later, you know, many months after the surgery, one should also consider 
stomal ulcer because at times i have found that a patient with vague abdominal pain weight regain you no know, vomiting sometimes excessive weight loss and you do an endoscopy and you find a stomal ulcer so vague abdominal pains should not be ignored further late complications anemia is a very common complication because of problem with iron absorption so is vitamin d and calcium deficiency so anemia vitamin d these two have to be tackled and one should assume that all our mgb patients are going to have problem of anemia and vitamin d and they have to take this supplement lifelong or at least on a long term basis some people get hyperproteinemia especially once where there is a combination of both uh, malabsorption as well as low intake of protein maybe because they are vegetarians maybe because they don't like to eat much protein combined with the malabsorption so hyperproteinemia can be a feature you can quickly diagnose these by you know patients can complain of swelling of the feet so edema of the feet can give rise to you know alarm bells that could this be hypoproteinemia bile reflux is the other late complication a uh, bile reflux quite often happens because in mgb the surgeon has not made the pouch long enough because the pouch has to be fairly large you should have close to 20 cm of the pouch so that your anastomosis the gastrojejunostomy is far away from the ge junction however in some patients despite a long pouch we could get bile reflux and this has to be managed conservatively again by diet and giving certain medications excess weight loss can be a problem and that may require giving patient higher calorie diet and even opting for reversal at times and this can at times also be because the surgeon was over enthusiastic and has bypassed a very long segment weight regain is rare because mgb perhaps gives one of the best weight loss amongst all the procedures which we have spoken about but we can get weight regain there we have to do a dietary recall try to find out what is the problem maybe you know have a program of diet exercise to do something about it really if after everything else if the weight regain is a problem one has to give up and say that sorry bariatric surgery has failed you there is not much you can do inadequate weight loss has options you can do a gastroplasty if you have got a wide sleeve you can consider putting a band like rajesh was just talking about earlier so you can put a band on top of the mgb you can also increase the limb length and increase the malabsorption so these are the few things one can do about for an inadequate weight loss or a weight regain how much success we will get is debatable because a lot of these revision procedures sound very good on paper but when you do it for a patient they may not give you that much of a help so dietary recall nutritional deficiency bypass length measurement all these things are important when we are dealing with an inadequate weight loss or weight regain when we talk about redo surgery we could be doing redo surgery after an mgb because there is nutritional deficiency or if there is severe gerd dumping syndrome which is not being managed marginal ulcers not healing anastomotic stenosis so these are the situations where one could consider doing a redo surgery in these mgb patients so what are the redo surgeries there are a few technique one is a lonroth technique i've drawn a diagram there so on the left if you see that mgb uh, and the common channel and the bp limb if you can see that's the direction in which i have made it so what can be done in this lonroth technique is that you divide the bp limb and shift it further so then that becomes the alimentary limb the bp limb and the common channel so you convert this into an rygb by the lonroth technique rutledge has another technique of his in which he instead of dividing the intestine there he divides the uh, gj and divides the gj and shifts it and then it causes an alimentary limb and a common channel there 
A third option is that you revise the entire procedure, which means you divide the GJ, you divide the anastomosis on both sides and create a proper RYGB. Lastly, sometimes we could be requiring a reversal of MGB. So when we have to do a reversal of MGV, we just divide above the gastrojejunostomy. The gastro gastrostomy is stapled and the jejunum stapled flush to the GJ and you can do a resection and astomosis of that area, which can be done lab or as most of these patients have lost a lot of weight, if the surgeon is not confident because this reversal procedure is going to be a very rare procedure, any bariatric surgeon is going to be doing in his bariatric career. So you can also talk about doing this part, uh, open surgery rather than lap surgery in case you are not experienced. So one of the uh, points here regarding reversal. So to summarize, all surgeries are prone to complications. Awareness is the first step in management of any complication. Prevention, early action is very important. I would underline early action because complications are bound to happen with everybody who does surgeries. What is crucial is if you can diagnose early and take early action, you will be able to salvage the situation. So a wise surgeon learns from experience and a wiser surgeon learns from others' experience. With those, I will come to the end of my talk. And thank you very much once more for inviting me to this prestigious IAGS Prime event. Uh, great talk, Dr. Aron. And uh, I'll start from first thing. Uh, first, we are talking of GJ leaks. Suppose there is no problem with your anastomosis, there is no problem from the handling of the surgeon. And the GJ leak is uh, disastrous in uh, OAGB. So, what extra steps to prevent GJ leak? Uh, there is no injury by the, your assistant, uh, there is no injury, a thermal injury to your loop. To, and yeah. as you know, OAGB leaks are, uh, sorry, RYGB leaks are less common than MGB leaks. RYGB, GJ leaks are very, very less common. MGP leaks are still heard of. So what extra step would you advise to the young surgeons to prevent these GJ leaks? Except all those things which are mechanical, which can happen, I can understand. Sure. So the extra steps which we can take in today's day and age is to also do an ICG dye test, which can tell you more about the vascularity of the area which you are anastomosing both before and after the anastomosis because nowadays most of the systems which we have have the facility of ICG. ICG dye hardly costs 100 rupees. Even the current robotic surgery which we are doing that also has an ICG monitor. Uh, the latest Olympus stores or uh, striker equipment they have ICG. So that is one area to consider because vascularity is something which you may not be able to appreciate that well during your surgery. Mechanical factors, as you say, have already been ruled out. Then do your anastomosis slowly. I think I would stress on that. Do not be in a hurry. You don't have to race with yourself or with any other surgeon. Do the anastomosis slowly. And I have always been practicing a leak test at the end of my procedure. So I would always want to do a leak test. Just a question, Dr. Arun. What is the importance of a hinge stitch at the end of the anastomosis between jejunum and gastrum? Because the end staplers are loose staplers. They are not as tight as the staplers which are starting. And the leak may happen from there because this anastomosis is under little tension more than RYGB. Is yeah. there any importance of a hinge stitch? Yeah, see what happens is normally you always, almost always put a end stitch because when you are closing your uh, uh, hole of the entro, uh, gastroenterostomy which you have made, that stitch line carries on because you never stitch it right at the end. So you just have to take two or three extra bites and you will uh, end up doing this uh, stitch which you are going to hinge it up. And I think that's a good idea 
most of us do it inadvertently even without realizing we are doing it so that's a great point and second is bleeding no? in fact in fact in when we talk about you know there are we talk about mgb slash oagb but there are quite a lot of differences that is something which can be discussed in a more focused bariatric meeting and one of the things which the oagb insists is that the anastomosis the uh, uh, stomach and the jejunum for about 2 cm above the anastomosis they should be uh, stitched further the reason they give for that is to prevent uh, reflux but at the same time as you are trying to say it also helps by giving that kind of a hinge sure sure uh, arun i think it is a very great point because in my experience also i would say that that stitch is going to not put any stress on your stepter and holding the intestine because the anastomosis some stress second we were talking about bleeding so i heard dr sandeep agrawal and totally agree about it in most of the bleedings once you have completed your surgery and you know there is no bleeding you come out and if any other thing occurs mostly you have to recognize it early and you have to manage it conservatively so in mgb why we have to intervene in a case of bleeding why can't we manage it conservatively no oh, i think the management of conservative versus intervention for the bleed post op follows the same gi principles like any gastrointestinal surgery there is nothing special about bariatric there the only thing is that perhaps i feel that the decision to go in and suture has to be a little more early compared to regular patients because we are dealing with patients who are morbidly obese and a delay you know puts most of your patients on the ventilator for a day or two even if you know you just go in even if you just go in suture come out everything is fine still a redo surgery in a morbidly obese puts them on the ventilator for a day or two and the longer you delay the more the risks so for that reason perhaps but otherwise the principles have to be the same whether you man by conservative or go in by the intervention you need to see the drop in hemoglobin the pulse the bp you do an endoscopy you know you follow the same uh, protocol as any gis definitely i agree to it and i also will like to add because there are the two staple lines here in sleep you have got only single staple line there is a staple line towards the remnant and there is a staple line towards the pouch so the bleeding can be disastrous sometimes and a more fall in hemoglobin may be there and you are very correct in mgb the bleeding has to be addressed more aggressively than any other surgery and i totally agree to you whatever you are saying see there is one complication i like to talk about uh, you have talked about biliary reflux you have talked about how to manage it you have talked about malnutrition you have talked about how to manage it standardization of uh, limb i'm not going to talk about it because it is again a very debatable question who to be a lot but uh, what about obstruction if there is an obstruction two questions one there is obstruction there is remnant stomach dilatation and what is your point once there is an obstruction because this obstructions are different from rvgb obstructions once there is a obstruction in the efferent limb immediately there will be vomiting but once there is a obstruction in afferent limb uh, efferent limb if there is a obstruction there is a vomiting and the yes. once there is obstruction in the afferent limb there will be a some dilatation yes. and blow out is going to be disastrous so what is going to be your take on that and second question i'll add what is your take about peterson's closure in uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass is a my last right no that's a very good uh, point you uh, pointed out in fact i'm going to after end of this meeting i'm going to modify my presentation and add a slide on that the afferent limb obstruction one has to be aware of so awareness is most crucial because only if you are aware of it you will be able to diagnose it and the diagnosis is generally made by a ct scan so once you make a diagnosis then you you know once you suspect you do a ct scan once you have diagnosed then you will have to go inside and rectify that problem so awareness as i would underline is the most important uh, point here the second point you mentioned was about peterson defect 
See, I have not been closing the Peterson defect, but we've heard one or two odd reports here and there about hernias from the Peterson defect. Now, exactly why that hernia happened, what was the situation in those rare cases, we don't know. So, I think jury is still out. Currently, I'm not closing, but and I've been doing this for quite some time now. Since 2011, I've been doing NGB. None of my patients have come back to me with that. And uh, if in due course of time, guidelines change and it becomes mandatory, then it's not a problem because to close the Peterson defect in MGB is much easier than closing the same in an RYGB. Yes, my, my take would be for young surgeons, not an experienced surgeons like you, which may take time and our patients come from far away. So taking two minutes to close Peterson's is not going to do any harm rather than not closing it. And third thing is, in malnutrition, last, I forgot to ask you, in malnutrition, if you fail to recover the patient by your diet plan and nutrition plan, do you think doing a remnant gastrostomy and feeding from that would can be a good option to may help them to recover from that or straight away you want to reverse the procedure? See, I have done this reversal only once. And in fact, I think I remember having discussed that case with you and I discussed that case with about five or six surgeons across, including Rutledge. <coughs> and I got a 50-50 response. Half the people said, no, go in immediately and do a reversal. While other half said, do a gastrostomy. I being a little more conservative, I went for the feeding gastrostomy. So I put in the feeding gastrostomy, gave the pro patient some nutrition from there. And six weeks later, then I did the reversal and closed the gastrostomy. Uh, after that. So I was quite happy with the results there. With experience of just one patient, I cannot say that I am an expert, but uh, I was happy with the results of a gastrostomy, two-stage procedure of a gastrostomy because I was a little scared to do the reversal in a hypoalbuminic patient who, if she leaked after that, in that bad nutritional state, things would have become more disastrous and we would have had a problem there. Now you are great learning, Dr. Arun. I do wait totally for you in our YGB or LGB. If we do have a very bad patient with a very bad hypocritinemia, first nourish them nicely and do a reversal. There is no harm in it. So this is not only my view, there are people published around it. So a very nice talk and the forum is open for other moderators to ask any questions from my side. That's, you know. The OGB is so so nice and so new and so controversial sometimes there can be endless questions to it. But in the paucity of time, we will have another meeting for it uh, to talk about it. Uh, any moderators, if you are on, want to ask any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Manish. And thanks, Arun. Wonderful presentation and excellent videos you showed. Uh, first in the world, you showed that uh, new kind of anastomosis, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it can definitely happen. I mean, people have reported various kinds of anastomotic uh, failures. So, wonderful. Uh, one question I just wanted to ask. Uh, uh, we had a earlier little discussion regarding uh, uh, sleeve. After sleeve, there is weight regain and then there is a reflux problem. Patient coming to you, would you offer MGB or would you offer RYGB? Or how would you proceed? See, there is again no literature or consensus on this topic and as a surgeon who does both RYGB and MGB, I personally would offer an RYGB in the people who have come with a reflux and an MGB in patients who have come with weight regain for the simple reason that anatomically or at least theoretically, the RYGB will be giving a longer uh, gap for the bile to reach the G junction. So the distance is much more. And the weight regain, I would offer an MGB because a restrictive procedure has already failed. So we should go for a strong malabsorptive procedure. Hence, in weight regain, I offer them MGB. But after MGB, is there not a chance of bile reflux? No, no. See, patients of bile reflux, I will uh, tell them. I will go for an RYGB. 
and patients with weight regain i will go for an rvi uh, for an mgb so if the patient is having hiatus hernia post leave with weight regain how to proceed weight regain with hiatus hernia i i think i would prefer to do a do and why bypass and also close the defect. defect at the same time thank you thank you nagwar <laughs> thank you uh, dr arun and dr manish which been a pleasure listening to you and i think uh, arun pesa sir was at uh, he shared all the his own complications and he took pains to collect all the other complications on this important procedure now with the permission of the ho moderator and the faculty we move on to the next session uh, ladies and gentlemen now i have the honor of inviting the most eminent uh, women bariatric surgeon who she has 2500 bariatric procedures under her experience in the last 15 16 years and uh, madam has been uh, madam aparna has been uh, from the mahatma gandhi institute of medical sciences sevagram and uh, since then uh, he has uh, spent time with taifi hospital and has been trained globally at various centers she also had a has the coveted certification of the surgeon of excellence from the uh, asmbs later on she is now uh, into the uh, leadership of the obesity center in mumbai where she is uh, exclusively concentrating on bariatric surgery and little bit of forehead surgery and hernia surgery as well ladies and gentlemen i also should share uh, she is uh, a brilliant artist by herself and uh, she has uh, one should take time to visit her website which displays the various artworks and she helps lot of uh, underprivileged community and she has been head of one important trust which does lot of good work for the welfare of the town trodden with that few words uh, may I have the honor of uh, inviting dr aparna govil ma'am on behalf of the iis prime time to moderate this session o to ma'am thank you so much uh, dr kanagwell for this uh, wonderful introduction and at the outset i would really like to thank iis and uh, president dr sunil popat as well as dr ishwar murthy and um, i think it's a very important session on complications because however good we may be and technically correct we may be ultimately law of averages will catch up with each and every one of us and finally i think surgeons are the people with the least amount of ego uh, having said that i think it's a really positive a move to include nutritional complications after bariatric surgery because as surgeons we only focus on surgical complications but bariatrics as we all know is not just about surgery it's about a lot of other things and with that i take the honor of introducing the very very eminent and knowledgeable dr sarfaraz beg uh, who is the director of uh, digestive surgery clinic in kolkata india he has also authored um, a book uh, called nutrition obesity and bariatric surgery we have also had the pleasure of working together on another book uh, and um, uh we are both co-editors on that and that is about the management of nutritional and metabolic complications of bariatric surgery uh of course um i think if we keep talking about him we will not really have the session we'll just keep talking about him uh, he is also a great poet philosopher singer and the list just goes on so i think uh, with that i would uh, like to invite dr beg for his um, uh, very interesting lecture thank you thank you aparna thank you dr kanagawal thank you iig as thank you dr sreel popar i think it's 10:30 either we have finished dinner or we're going to have dinner don't want to be either ways obstructing any time schedule so i'll go straight away to the talk that i have been given diagnosis and management of nutritional deficiencies after bariatric surgery first of all we are all bariatric surgeons we know that we are either causing a reduction in the gastric volume or we are simultaneously bypassing duodenum and proximal jejunum in the three most common bariatric procedures done across the world which means we need to know what is it that we bypass when we bypass the duodenum and the jejunum also what happens if we cut the hydrochloric acid by gastric reduction in a nutshell this particular photograph or, or diagram gives an idea about what is happening the body 
wants to absorb all the important things in the proximal gut. Unfortunately, bariatric surgeons have to work on the proximal gut. And therefore, we tend to lose macronutrients and micronutrients. Among the macronutrients is the protein and essential fatty acids at times which are lost because of malabsorption and the uh, differentials in pH and many things which contribute. And as far as micronutrients are concerned, the most two most important metals, iron and calcium, which is absorbed in the duodenum by active transportation, that is being lost. And that is why we talk so much about anemia and bone health after bariatric surgery. At least this overview is important to understand what is going to come up next. So the reasons why this is happening is because there is low calorie intake after bariatric surgery, there's malabsorption, the duodenum, which is a very important source of absorption of vital micronutrients are being bypassed, there is hypochlorhydria, and we also realize that there is food intolerance after bariatric surgery. All of this contribute to nutritional deficiencies. If I had to put it in one picture, what macronutrients are going to be affected most is the protein. Because amino acids are absorbed in the jejunum. You may now start thinking that in a sleeve gastrectomy, the duodenum is not by jejunum is not bypass. Therefore, it might sound that it is very innocuous and innocent. Actually, it is not. The reason being that with a sleep gastrectomy, there is hypermotility in the duodenum as seen in, and observed in the research, which reduces the contact time of the nutrients with the duodenum and the, the proximal jejunum, thus leading to a functional bypass. Therefore, these same things are happening both in sleeve and in bypass, or albeit I must say it's happening more in bypass. Amongst the micronutrients, the minerals like calcium and iron, as I mentioned, is going to get deficient. We have to be watchful on that. Zinc and copper being the other two. As far as the uh, vitamins are concerned, fat-soluble vitamins are absorbed in the ileum. And since we work entirely on the foreguard, technically we should be thinking, well, it should not get malabsorbed, the A, D, E, N, K. Actually, it's true. A, E, N, K are rare deficiencies after bariatric surgery. But vitamin D is there is some deficiency. But again, after the surgery, one might see the vitamin D status improves because of less sequestration. But it is the water-soluble vitamins which has hit badly. B1, uh, folate, B12, B6, B2, B3, all these are affected because they're all absorbed in the proximal jejunum. B12 is, however, absorbed in the ileum. Still, the problem why B12 gets malabsorbed is because the intrinsic factor produced in the antrum is cut down and therefore that hampers the absorption despite the fact that B12 was absorbed in the ileum. Therefore, if, if we were to understand the previous slide, it stands to reason that these bariatric patients are going to have iron deficiency anemia, also B12 and folic acid uh, deficiency anemia, bone weaknesses because of calcium deficiency, protein energy malnutrition because the proteins are getting lost, especially if the bypass is more uh, aggressive and radical. Hair loss uh, will come to telogen effluvium for some time in the subsequent slide. And neuropathy can happen at times because of B-complex deficiency. And also there may be immunogenic reasons behind neuropathies. Let's just look at four or five case scenarios to understand how to diagnose and manage these. 38-year-old female had a Ruin Y gastric bypass, and at one year, she has exertional breathlessness. Uh, well, when I climb stairs, I get breathless doctor. Otherwise, I'm okay. Now, that should make a suspect there could be anemia. And truly, the hemoglobin came as 8.9. At times, one may not find hemoglobin low, but rather you would find the iron is low or ferritin is low, and that will produce the same kind of symptoms. So we have to be aware of the fact that the hemoglobin may be normal. So what are the causes of iron deficiency anemia after the bariatric surgery, which is the commonest problem, by the way, after bariatric surgery, as far as nutrition is concerned? First thing is make sure that the patient is not losing blood. Remember, 80% of bariatric patients are women in the reproductive age group. If they're having menorrhagia, that would be enough to cause iron deficiency anemia. And maybe we're not supplementing enough. Also, some of these patients do not tell us that they are having piles bleeding. That's also important to take. 
so while we rule out menorrhage and pies remember bariatric it's, uh, surgery itself can be ulcerogenic like a gastric bypass could be ulcerogenic and therefore it's important to uh, do endoscopy to rule out an ulcer bleed what are the tests that we need to do in these patients well because it's uh, anemia we do iron ferritin and tsat all three of them do not think that just doing a serum iron is enough it's absolutely mandatory to do iron ferritin and tsat together for meaningful interpretation b12 folate and albumin should also be measured to rule out anemia because of these deficiencies these are the first line tests but in our center what we do is we always look at the peripheral blood smear if you find it is microcytic we think it must be an iron deficiency or a copper deficiency whereas if it is megaloblastic it could be b12 and folate and normocytic deficiency means there is a chronic inflammation going on most of these patients already have a ongoing chronic inflammation and some of these will have a persistence of chronic inflammation and some patients also have chronic liver disease which is also a, a reason for chronic inflammation so if we got a microcytic anemia in the peripheral smear low iron low ferritin and normal b12 and folate this is a classical iron deficiency anemia but rarely would you find a picture like this in a bariatric patient i'm not going to details but i'll just say that nowadays it's important to rem remember that oral iron may not be tolerated by everyone it may not be efficacious in everyone because of a phenomenon called chronic inflammation and hepcidin excess which leads to suppression of iron incorporation for erythropoiesis therefore intravenous iron is coming in a big way in bariatric armamentarium and in fact there is a tendency nowadays to talk about hepcidin levels as well to know and the crp levels to know if there's chronic inflammation in which case oral iron may not be suitable in these patients also even if the b12 and folate is normal we must add for adequate erythropoiesis but what if all the tests come normal and the patient is still having a low hemoglobin then we do second line tests that's copper zinc vitamin a and e they can be responsible for anemia also chronic diseases like cirrhosis and chronic kidney disease is not very uncommon with obese patients may also be the reason so that is one of the algorithm that we develop but i think that's for another day refractory iron deficiency anemia every time you find that there is uh, you give iron and the patient is not improving think about chronic inflammation think about hepcidin in excess think about uh, giving intravenous iron there is much more to come in this area but i think that's beyond the ambit or scope of the topic of the talk today let's go to another case capsule another gastric bypass on the fourth year this patient has a low back pain and she has stopped her supplements two years back that's pretty common for a lot of patients who think that they are doing well while should they take an expensive supplement costing about 6 to 8000 rupees a month so she had a low back pain radiation to the legs and she was not responding to analgesics so uh, fortunately she came to us and we could say why don't you do something about it do an mri or uh, an x-ray she said why we should just do it it's important so think about osteopenia fractures disc prolapse in these patients and uh, do lab tests like urinary calcium alkaline phosphatase vitamin d parathormone bone scan and an mri or an x-ray of lumbar spine you may notice that although we have written these tests i have not mentioned serum calcium that's because serum calcium is not a good marker of total body calcium is the urinary calcium even parathormone is a better indicator therefore we did this and we did not do serum calcium and what did we find a compression fracture of the lumbar vertebra and that is the uh, that is what may happen in fact if you look at the literature you may find that there is a 1.4 times increased fracture risk after bariatric surgery in normal population and secondary hyperparathyroidism uh, from sleeve to gastric bypass it keeps on increasing more the malabsorption more the secondary hyperparathyroidism and we must measure parathormone in these patients because as i said serum calcium is not a good marker urinary cal calcium is come to them uh, do that for most centers don't do it but if you are not doing it at least check the parathormone vitamin d bone scans alkaline phosphatase to have an indirect idea about bone health in these patients having a fracture is a disaster in a bariatric patient uh, although it's rare it's something to be worried about strategy give calcium citrate don't give everything in one go divide them throughout the day for better absorption in bariatric patients remember they have been gi altered anatomy vitamin d needs to be given p12 
patients need to do exercises. It's the exercise, the physical training, which improves bone health. And very few patients realize that. They think that their bone is weak. They don't want to exercise. It's just the reverse. Bone scans are important after two years to know about osteopenia. And finally, I've written bisphosphonates and canceled it to suggest that bisphosphonates are contraindicated in this setting. Case capsule, another case capsule. Uh, I must give credit to my senior colleague, Dr. Praveen Bhatia from Delhi. He shared this case capsule, very interesting, 35-year-old male, hypertension, had a sleep gastrectomy three weeks back, and he presented with vomiting and dysphagia. Uh, he also had weakness, dribbling of saliva, confusion, and he was seeing uh, double vision. What is this? This is some sort of a neuropathy. And this is how he looked. And this is how he was walking. And if you look at his gait, you can see that this gait is not normal. It's bodily. So differential diagnosis, hypertensive male boy. Can he have a stroke? Yes, he can have a stroke. Is it this vomiting is secondary to stenosis in a sleeve and then leading to thiamine deficiency or directly a thiamine deficiency? Well, all of them are possible. MRI brain was normal. Gastroscopy revealed no stenosis and the vitamin B1 was low normal. And therefore, it was put on uh, intravenous thiamine. There's plenty of literature on vernix encephalopathy after sleep gastrectomy and bypass. And... It's important to know that the thiamine RDA is only one milligram per day. And when it is a therapeutic dose, it's 100 to 300 milligrams per day intravenous. So don't be scared. That is the dose that needs to be given to reverse a vernix encephalopathy. And therefore, this should be given till the patient recovers. And then the patient should be put on 100 milligram per day, oral thiamine on discharge. Don't worry about toxicity. B complexes are water soluble vitamins. They do not have toxic effects. They are washed away out of the body. So that's very important. But there are other reasons for neuropathies. If you see a patient at two years or three years or six months or three months, all of them may have a different cause of neuropathy. Uh, Vernix is usually an early cause of neuropathy. But a mechanical neuropathy because of posture and the way patient is positioned in the OT can lead to a neuropathy, a foot drop as well. And there are certain inflammatory neuropathies. Uh, Gulenbari-like uh, syndromes, which can happen after bariatric surgery, which we must be aware of because if they are not treated early with steroids and admission, they can have permanent damage. And finally, nutritional cause of neuropathy like copper can happen in third or fourth year onwards in a bypass patient especially. And therefore, one must be aware of measuring serum copper and assessing neuropathies at this time. Now, I... I uh, there, there are a huge list of what are important in neuropathy, but this is a, more or less the commonest causes or nutritional causes for neuropathies. Let's move on. A one on osmosis gastric bypass is a more malabsorptive procedure than a sleeve and a Rio Ru and Y gastric bypass, less than a duodenal switch. So it is somewhere between the Ru and Y and the, the duodenal switch. And this patient, after operation, lost from 150 kg to 80 kg at one year. And I wasn't there at the center and the nutrition said, well, you're doing great. You lost 70 kgs in a year. Uh, but, you know, at 2.5 years, this gentleman came with severe weakness, unable to walk, oily stool, leg edema, severe pala, and more than 100% ex excess body weight loss. Now, I must say here, the reason why this patient did not come for uh, a year or so is because he had some personal problems in a different country and he was not allowed to move out. And imagine when we operate on, on our patients who come from different countries, if this happens and there's nobody to give bariatric uh, uh, you know, nutritional follow-up, this is what patients can come up with. He came with that zephoid protruding out. He had bad malnutrition. What lesson we learned is, a, as a nutritionist, as a surgeon, don't only see body weight. See body composition analysis. Look at fat mass. Look at fat-free mass. If the muscle loss or the fat-free mass is more than 20% of the total weight loss, that's abnormal. So somebody's lost uh, 50 kilos, but more than 10 kilos is muscle. Beware this could be leading to cachexia, sarcopenia, or protein energy malnutrition. Beware. And this is the body composition analysis, which I always show, suggesting that whether, whether surgeons are aware that uh, how to interpret this. So that's for another day again. Now, treatment is you've got to admit this patient, can't go home. This patient has to be assessed. They have a low albumin, low hemoglobin, and that's that's 8.5. Actually, is after dehydration, it must be about 3 or 4. 
D is low, iron is low. They need to be hydrated, electrolyte correction, especially phosphates need to be given, taxes need to be given. They need to be on a parenteral nutrition, multivitamin infusions, and iron infusions as well. And these patients would first need a tube gastrostomy, as Dr. Arun Prasad said, and then they can have a reversal. Finally, alopecia after a sleep gastrectomy. Very common after any uh, bariatric procedure, one may see that there is an alopecia. The important thing to remember is this is telogen effluvium, where the patient's uh, hairs are going into the stage of uh, dormancy. The, what you need to do is tell them their hair follicles are still intact. They just wanted dormancy. They will come back, reassure them. But if these patients come with alopecia at 18 months, then there is no complacency. One has to look at compliance of the patient with supplements and check the albumin, iron, ferritin, zinc, folate, and essential fatty acids. And if these are abnormal, then they need to be replenished. Biotin is a high, mostly in the pharma companies. There's little evidence, but maybe it does contribute to hair loss, but not as much as iron and zinc. So if you have to supplement, you must supplement them with good amount of iron and zinc. And it's important to understand, uh, although we are not dermatologists, we need to understand that alopecia could be scarring and non-scarring. Some patients with alopecia already have a pre-existing psoriasis. These patients have a scarring alopecia. Now, those ones are different from the non-scarring alopecia seen in bariatric surgery. That has to be differentiated, A. Two, if it is a non-scarring alopecia, topical solutions like minoxidil may work. And nutrients, nutrients which are appropriate needs to be given to these patients. Largely, it should be protein, iron, and zinc, and essential fatty acids. I would like to stop here because I think this is enough for a day. There are many things uh, that can be discussed. But I'll rather spend uh, time on discussion than uh, going on. So the take-home message I would like to give from this talk is, no matter how beautiful a bariatric surgery you do, and no matter what procedure you do, what good is a good procedure if it does not lead to good outcome? Any center doing bariatric surgery will have to learn about bariatric nutrition if they want to have optimal results from the patient. Remember, nowadays we're talking about PROM, patient reported outcome measure. And if we are talking about PROM, then PROM has to, uh, has to have a nutritional follow-up very diligently in our center. And that is what is going to mark the success of a bariatric center. Thank you very much. Aparna, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beg. I think that was a wonderful lecture. And I do agree with you that it, it can go on. It can be a whole um, session by itself. And um, I just have a couple of um, things that I would like you to comment on. And the first one is that um, uh, most of these patients with obesity, they actually, um, though we think that they are overnourished, but they are actually very malnourished. And what is your take on that? And what is your take on optimization, nutritional optimization of patients before bariatric surgery? How long should we give it? How much? And um, so, so yeah. on. So very important question. Obviously, for the paucity of time, I eliminated many things. One of that is this, that obese patients, when they come to us, they have a paradoxical malnutrition. And the paradoxical malnutrition is a big, let's say, for iron. I'll just give you an example. Iron deficiency is very common in uh, obese people. Why? Because they have chronic inflammation. And because of chronic inflammation, there's high hepcidin, high CRP. What does hepcidin do? It sequesters the iron into the enterocytes and the macrophages. They don't get into the blood circulation. They're not utilized for erythropoiesis. So in effect, although this patient has a total high uh, 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 total body iron, but the blood iron is very low. And for erythropoiesis, it's not available. Therefore, they have anemia. So imagine this is a paradoxical malnutrition. Similarly, vitamin D, it gets sequestered in the fat. And therefore, vitamin D is very low in these patients. Almost 80 to 90% of obese patients have low vitamin D. So we need to realize that these patients, although they may have a higher calorie intake, but either because of poor dietary choices or by because of these biological reasons, they will have paradoxical malnutrition. So A, D, iron, these are malnutrition that you will see commonly in obese people with different reasons altogether. Right. Thank you. And uh, my second uh, question is about um, checklists. I know that you follow, uh, you're a great follower of checklists. And um, yeah. uh, would you like to say something about that? There is a lot that needs to be looked into after bariatric surgery. So what is your recommendation to 
junior and senior surgeons, everybody, because I think everybody should have these checklists. So what do you want to say about that? A, I want to say that uh, don't rely on your memory. It's very poor. Just accept it that your memory is very poor. Checklist by Atul Gawande is a great book to read. And once you read that, you realize that everything has to be written. So A, two things. Before the patient goes for bariatric surgery, there is a checklist. And two things are important in our center. Nutritional clearance and psychological things. If the psychologist doesn't clear the patient, we don't operate. If the nutrition doesn't clear, we don't operate. So that's part of the checklist pre-operative. Post-operative, we have a history performer, a clinical examination performer, lab test performer, and that is written and everything is checked. Uh, I, I have it in my presentation. I could have shared it, but I think for the lack of time, that will not be done. But make your own, own performer where you have to write the details rather than investing in your memory. Uh, just write those things down and everything uh, in history. For example, I will just say, uh, don't miss on body composition analysis. But if you don't write it down, you'll miss it. And if you don't do body composition analysis, one may miss the malnutrition, the PEM with uh, malabsorptive procedures. So I can just go on with various examples. I'm just going to say that have a pro forma for uh, history for dieting, uh, the, uh, dietary history, psychological history, behaviors, uh, everything on the paper so that you just keep on marking them. Right. So I think a good follow up, if it is done properly, it takes a minimum of 30 to 45 minutes per patient. And uh, that is uh, one of the issues with bariatric surgery, that follow up OBD is huge and it takes very long. So uh, my last uh, question uh, for your comment would be, uh, what should be the ideal follow up protocol? And do you think there is any difference between um, procedures and their follow-ups or should it be uniform across bariatric procedures? So I'm just going to quote the ASMBS guidelines. The guidelines say that for sleeve or bypass or any other bariatric procedure, it should be the same follow-up. Lab tests may differ. In a bypass, more malabsorptive procedures, one may do lab tests a little more stringently. You may add zinc and copper and fat-soluble vitamins as well. Whereas in a sleep, you may like to omit a few, uh, omit them and do only if indicated. So that's the lab test difference. As far as intervals are concerned, it's the same. But when it comes to supplementation, again, it's lifelong. It's not one year or two years or three years or four years, but it's lifelong. Lifelong supplementation, lifelong monitoring. But for a sleep versus a bypass, one gives lesser dose of uh, supplement compared to a bypass. For example, one RDA of uh, uh, one RDA of uh, B2 will be enough for for uh, sleep, but not for bypass. So one will have to understand that when you have these bariatric uh, supplements, they will say you have to give two capsules in a day for a bypass, but one capsule in a day for uh, or one tablet in a day for a sleep patient. So apart from these uh, smaller differences, as far as follow up intervals are concerned. As far as uh, uh, duration of supplementation is concerned, is the same. Thank you so much. And I think, like I said, the topic uh, could be an entire session in itself. Uh, but due to paucity of time, I think uh, we really need to close this now. Uh, I would like to hand over uh, the thing back to Dr. Kanagwell and Dr. Sunil Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Faraz, for uh, giving this lecture from your car and uh, waiting for the dinner <laughs> will <laughs> will let you go for your uh, much deserved dinner now thank you so much wonderful thank lecture. you thank you so much sir thank you very much thank you dr apanna and uh, dr saf it's been uh, exciting to listen as ever and uh, you did more than justice for a speaker to speak about nutrition we look forward to have you more on board for future academics. And I thank Taparna ma'am for making it more lively and sharing her contribution towards the nutritional work as well. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, sir. Now we move on to the next important session. Complication after complication, it becomes exciting and exciting way of learning. And I'm sure this is the most happening uh, stuff which is happening in the endosco endotherapy for bariatric uh, procedures. For that, I have the honor of inviting our uh, honorary secretary, Dr. S. Ishwar Murthy, sir. Dr. Ishwar Murthy, sir, uh, has uh, six gold medals. Can I hear you? We lost your voice. Can we go ahead? 
Hello, Ishwar. Good evening. Yeah, I'll go. Good evening. Good evening. Bringing in the... Can I give it? Let me go. It's fine because people know me. Let me introduce uh, Ishwar. <laughs> Ishwar, welcome. Honorary Secretary of IGS uh, for last one and a half years. And uh, very dynamic and basic laparoscopic and endoscopic surgeon. Uh, Ishwar will moderate the session on complication of uh, ESG, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. Over to you, Ishwar. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you, Kanagavail, for this uh, very entertaining prime time today. Dear viewers, I, right now, I'm very, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Mogit Bandari from Hindu. He is one of the bariatric surgeons for excellence. As you all are aware, he has done more than 15,000 bariatric procedures. And you go to Guinness book, Limca book, his name will be there. And I'm very, very nice to see as an endoscopic uh, practitioner myself to see that he brought the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty to India in 2017. And now he has established a world-class bariatric endoscopic unit, the go to place to look. So I always admire his hunger to learn and teach. And let us go without much ado to Dr. Mogit Bandari to share his pearls of wisdom on the ESG and its complication. What all the budding surgeons to learn from him. Over to you, sir. Yes, Mogit, we are with you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Mohit Bandari from India at Indore and I am Founder, Director and Chief Surgeon at Mohawk Bariatric and Robotic Surgery Center. Uh, first of all, big congratulations to the organizing committee and I have been asked to speak about endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty complications. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, the important one is that I work for Apollo Endosurgery, uh, Pentex and Olympus uh, and also Professor Galvao. Uh, NATO is a director of bariatric endoscopy services at uh, Mohawk Bariatric and Robotic Surgery Center here in India. And uh, we are so proud and honored to have the world's most distinguished leader, Professor Galvao, on board with us here in India. Uh, Manuel helped to establish bariatric endoscopy in different parts of the world, and including India, where if bariatric endoscopy has arrived, it is because of Professor Manuel Galvao NATO. Uh, he recently joined our department and he is trying to bring a lot of new things, trying to introduce a lot of uh, new services like the pH manometry services, uh, uh, dedicated uh, intragastric balloon program, the post 2 uh, and obviously the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. So uh, if we talk about our center, we are primarily a bariatric center uh, and we have done close to 15,000 bariatric procedures. If out of them you see around 600 plus uh, uh, have been the endoscopic sleeves, we all know that endoscopic bariatric procedures are basically a bridge gap between the medical therapy and the surgical therapy. But the surgical therapy has a steep learning curve. And also if we see endoscopic suturing, it also has a steep learning curve. The only difference is that there we are breaching the abdominal wall and here we are just doing an endoscopic method where there is nothing on the abdominal wall. Uh, there are different suture patterns of endoscopic sleeve and we should all understand that it is not equivalent to sleeve gastrectomy in any way because in sleeve gastrectomy the gastric transit time uh, is very less and the food empties into the duodenum pretty fast whereas the simple mechanism on which endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty is based is delaying the gastric emptying. So you can see that there is a very delayed gastric emptying and this has been published by several others including Abu Dayab. Uh, that is how uh, if we see uh, a particular endoscopic sleeve would look like. So this is a very beautiful video taken by Manuel Galvao. Uh, we did, both of us, me and Manuel, we did this case in Bangalore. And if you can see, this is the endoscopic picture. And parallelly, you would see the laparoscopic view of how uh, the endoscopic sleeve looks. So pretty good, pretty tight. It looks like a sleeve gastrectomy for the surgeons who are watching this. This was a cirrhotic male. Uh, keen only for endoscopic sleeve and he lost already around 20 kgs. This is a very beautiful MR image. It's a dynamic image and it is showing how uh, the uh, food empties after the endoscopic sleeve. So basically uh, in these many cases we at our own center 
we did couple of revisions uh, this was this is our data uh, very impressive 19 to 20 percent of total weight loss with good resolution of comorbidities but yes we have complications so what is what are the complications for endoscopic sleeve so uh, this was published by my friend Gontran Lopez Nava and uh, Reem Sharia and they reported that the serious adverse effect events in the endoscopic sleeve is two percent perigastric inflammatory serous fluid collection can happen uh, the best management to do uh, treat it is percutaneous drainage there can be submassive pulmonary embolism 72 hours after the procedure. And uh, I think Manuel Galvao told me that they published the Brazilian consensus and they could publish that they had one death due to this procedure because of pulmonary embolism. Self-limited hemorrhage after splenic lacerations. It can obviously happen because you're taking those sutures close to the fundus and you can take a bite through it. Pneumoperitoneum and pneumothorax can obviously occur and a tube placement or a surgical drainage can be one of the uh, surgical treatment can be one of the options. Uh, if you see this particular study, uh, the intra-abdominal collection 0.4%, hemorrhage requiring transfusion or endoscopic intervention 0.4%, refractory symptoms requiring the ESG revisual, uh, reversal 0.2%, pneumoperitoneum and pneumothorax 0.1%, pulmonary embolism 0.1%. So we see it's a 1% rate of complication, much less than bariatric surgery. That's that's pretty significant. So this you can see is a hemorrhage from the line of the endoscopic sleeve. Uh, the hemorrhage can be pretty much uh, radical uh, and uh, these are the perigastric collections and as you can see uh, this is shown on the CT scan uh, the contrast done 12 day post endoscopic sleeve and you can see this these kind of collections these are not very uncommon uh, there can be gastric perforations so you see uh, this is uh, the perforation uh, it's very beautiful case report uh, and uh, you know so these these things are common so Another case uh, where you find a lot of bleeding, uh, uh, specifically after endoscopic sleeve. This is a case where we had uh, one of our the, one of the colleagues who shared this video. Uh, they they shared that there was a leak after endoscopic sleeve. So this is common. Biliary peritonitis after endoscopic sleeve is also reported. Uh, and this particular uh, pub study published by Gontran. Lopez Nava in gastrointestinal endoscopy shows that you can take a bite through the gallbladder and perforate it. And, uh, you know, that that's that's common. Uh, talking about the conversions, the beautiful thing with this procedure is that you can do both sleeve gastrectomy and uh, Ruawai gastric bypass after both of these procedures. So people say that it's very difficult to convert. No, it's a very simple procedure to convert. And as you can see, these are peak cinches. And this procedure failed, and this is the This is the laparoscopic sleeve done at our center. Very easily, we could do a banded sleeve, and then you can see this endoscopy, and you know, beautiful area. This is this is one of the area where we got a proline suture, uh, which got into our stapler. We cut it, and we could complete the procedure. So at this point of time, we are uh, there uh, managing most of these complications. But what I would say, nausea, vomiting, epigastric plane, and reflux with reflux and Dehydration remain the most common complication. I already discussed about bleeding, stomach leaks, blood clots and pulmonary embolism, stenosis. If you try and go very close to the lesser curvature of the stomach, uh, the esophageal injuries are common if you try and, you know, use a double lumen scope without an overtube. And uh, these complications are also accompanied by 5 to 8% of patients who do not have significant weight loss or they have weight regain. We don't call them necessarily complications, but poor outcomes after endoscopic sleeve. And obviously a revision ESG or conversion to surgical revisions or concomitant usage of drug and physical therapy are, uh, you know, a uh, good thing. This is our Mohawk data. We had absolutely, absolutely no bleeding, no blood clots, no stenosis. God forbidden, we never had, uh, you know, uh, God willing, we never had bad complications like esophageal injuries, or injury to the gallbladder or anything like that. But yes, we had very high incidence of nausea and vomiting. We had 1% to 2% incidence of esophagogastric pain and reflux and some dehydrations. So to conclude, my friends, endoscopic sleeve has minimal complications, much less than bariatric surgery. It is very effective procedure. And after doing this large series of more than 600 cases, it still finds a very important place in the algorithm which we use to treat. Uh, all we need to do, as Professor Phoebe says, is to maintain a data in a prospectively maintained database, keep assessing it over a regular period of time, 
and then uh, you know after sometimes you would realize how you can change your practice in the light of that particular prospectively maintained database thank you very much ladies and gentlemen thank you dr mogit that was wonderful to have your uh, very concise and confident presentation and uh, very open to all the problems one can foresee just for the uh, benefit of all the youngsters who are watching from india we want to know whether is it a procedure on evolution of a technique and a revolution or you think it has a, a bright future in the indian population what's your view on that Mugit, can we can you take this question over to mohit mohit uh, ishwar that uh, lecture was uh, recorded earlier at few okay, hours ago Okay. Uh, as he was traveling and uh, he was to connect uh, from the airport. I That's don't fine. know, uh, Nitin, has he connected? Uh, uh, sir, I think he is still in the mute. Right. I think we can conclude in the way Probably. we are. Yeah. Ishwar, sir, please go ahead with the time. Yeah. yeah, I think from what I can see from the literature, I think uh, from the vast experience and the interest on this uh, procedure and the Apollo overseas based on which this procedure has been done apart from the ESG it has other extended indication the equipment itself and once people pass through the learning curve I, I think it has a potential initially there was some uh, uh, skepticism because we are not removing the fund as now he Mohit has clearly explained it is the delayed gastric emptying which is a real basis is not ending up gut hormonal changes that is making the difference of weight loss and uh, the thing is i'm sure it is a uh, few years down the line we'll know that even though uh, the results the efficacy may be slightly inferior to the lab sleep i'm sure the indications are going to be more defined and uh, the technique is going to be more refined i'm sure sooner or later it is going to find its place once we prove the efficacy and also cost effectiveness in our indian population so with that, I think we'll conclude the talk. If there is any questions in the uh, YouTube channel or anything else, uh, can I give you, please come over. Otherwise, we'll conclude this session because it's now close to 11 o'clock. Yeah, I think we'll need to conclude now. Uh, we have had a wonderful session, Ishwar. Thank yeah. you. And uh, well, we had a very interesting thing that uh, several of our speakers were uh, giving lecture while traveling. Sarfraz gave from his car. Our uh, convener, Dr. Kanagwell, was moderating from the car himself. And yeah. Mohit was actually traveling from one airport to another airport. So that's the beauty of uh, this uh, digital world. and. Uh, uh, overall, uh, we had a very successful program. So I would request Kanagwell to take it forward. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you, all the speakers. I will have the honor of inviting our secretary, honorary secretary, to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you. Can you see my slides, Kanagwell? I'll quickly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Short and sweet. Okay, thank you. Very much. Thank you. I think we need to thank our president and also Kanagwell having brought uh, uh, this. Three hours, I think literally we had three hours of this uh, marathon on the bariatrics uh, with the five masters in this episode of Prime Time. Thanks to all of you. I think we had a wonderful discussion on various complications on the common bariatric procedures. And I really thank all of our moderators who stayed and interacted with all the speakers and our heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Sandeep Agarwal, Dr. Rajesh Puller, Dr. Arun Prasad. Dr. Sarfraz Baik and Dr. Mohit Bandari, we have already sent them all the certificate of appreciation as we they spoke and uh, our uh, appreciations to them and also the moderators. And quickly to come to some important news for the benefit of all our uh, new members. Uh, as you all know, we had a very interesting, exciting intercontinental webinar uh, last month. And uh, from there on, we moved from the online mode to the on-site with the COVID trading and with the Kanagavail hosting a twin uh, treat of EFAGS and FAGS, the basic endoscopy laparoscopy program with the first time cadaver program. It was a huge success with close to 200 
delegates participating. We can see the happy faces, fellowship and friends up. And this is the first time this year we also had the Tamil Nadu Medical Council credit points for both the courses. And we can see a glimpse of our treasurer doing the first cadaver endoscopic program also. And uh, there also we have the mobile lab. I want all the members to go and uh, uh, upload this uh, app, yeah, whether you have an Apple phone or Android phone, you can have this and all the updated programs and everything will be in touch of your uh, button away. And the next month in October, sorry, this month, later this month, the 22nd to 24th, we'll be back in Chennai in Gem Hospital under uh, uh, Praveen Raj for this colorectal. Please join this course. I'm sure it will be a very exciting one. And if you keep watching, we are going to be very vibrant with more academic coming with the Goa in November 19th to 21st. Watch the calendar. People who have done on-site program, want an, uh, I mean, it's an online program who wants to come for assessment. This is the next place where they can come. So please contact Dr. Jaydi Palib, who is a course convener and coordinator for this and December is going to be a hectic week, not only for you, for all of us in EC, because we will be traveling almost all weekends with the falls bariatric, hernia, robotic, and hoji uh, from one corner of our country to the other corner. Finally, settling down to Trichy for a twin program in January, and then Trivandrum, and then finally, we all want to invite you all to Rajamundri in 10th to 13th February for a Grand Gala Fellowship Convocation and also an excellent conference, free conference masterclass. All because of the dynamism of our president and all of our EC, we thank them all. And we also want to tell all of our academicians, like postgraduates and also the young IEGIS members about our academic initiatives. If you are interested, please write to us for a best postgraduate thesis award, the links will be available on request to me as iagsacademics.gmail.com and also the IAGS best researcher award. And there are five awards in each category worth not only one lakh cash reward, also a certificate of appreciation during our convocation. So more to see, everything will you will find out either in the IAGS Connect or in the mobile app. Until then, we thank Kanagavel, Professor Sunil Puppet, the whole Doc Luxus team for a seamless transmission and a good night. Bye bye now. Thank you. Thank you, Ishwar. Thank you, everybody. Good night, President. Good night, Secretary. Sir. Good night, Doc Luxus uh, team and uh, all the friends who are connected at various platforms. Good, of yes. good night, everyone. Good bye. night, sir. Good night, sir. Have a good night. Take care.